When I was around six, I lived in a huge house that was quite intimidating and not very homey. I used to hear a man's voice shouting in my ears, but I think I knew it was in my head too. I would go down to the large garden and shout back and say things like, shut up, etc. Anyways, I came to find that a builder fell off the roof and passed away during construction. My mom also said that she felt a force behind her while she was walking down the stairs sometimes. I've had a few other paranormal or psychotic episodes in my life. I went to an old boarding school established 1895 and have vague memories of seeing what I only imagined to be ghosts or spirits walking in the courtyard and passengers when I would wake up randomly at night. These experiences don't seem very clear, but they also don't seem like a dream. I also remember waking up one night and seeing my friend reaching for the cabinet above his bed. I asked what he was doing because it was very late and dark. I turn on the light and he's fast asleep under his duvet. What I saw was just a dark silhouette. Now more recently after going out, I came home to my flat alone and kept hearing my friend's voice calling me. It felt so real and I would follow the voice to see my friend or respond. I just couldn't convince myself that I was alone for some reason. About three weeks ago now, after another night like that, I experienced full-blown psychosis, I think. I was dancing and the venue had these trees near the DJ. They were brushing my arm and torso and I was totally convinced that was someone was rubbing their hands on me and kind of groping me. It made me flinch a couple of times and I was able to tell myself it was in my head. I then asked my friend to swap places with me and it was fine after that. Just to clear this up now, there's a likelihood of this being something my own mind has conjured up and circumstances around it possibly just falling into place out of sheer coincidence. I'm sure this is common, however, there are certain aspects that just get me and make me think it's possibly something on top of that. And just to clear up now, never had a history of psychosis or anything of the sort, no mental health problems in the past, maybe fleeting anxiety, although lucid dreaming is something I've tried to practice a lot. So there's a distinct possibility I've created this from somewhere in my mind, but this felt different to me, very different, hence why I'm posting it. This event happened about three months ago. I went to sleep as normal, and when I say normal, I meant by browsing Reddit for hours before I actually sleep until about 3 a.m., which yeah, is normal for me. Oh, and just in case this becomes relevant, I'm a 25 year old female. I remember drifting into sleep while still on my phone. And that's how I knew I'm like, okay, time to put my phone on charge and probably fall asleep. I'm not sure how long into my sleep this happened, but it started by my name being called repeatedly. I'm not sure how long for, but at one point it got my attention and I was distinctly aware that I'm not awake, but conscious and speaking to someone that isn't me. For the purposes of this post, I'm going to refer to this future self as they slash them. They asked me if I'm aware. I tried to say yes. No sound came out. On either side. There were no words. It's just like thinking. And the awareness is there. Instantly understanding images, but no words. They told me that I'm speaking to myself and that the year for them is 2077 and that they've been in an accident caused serious brain damage and organ damage and have been put into a coma. They told me I'm basically not alive, but machines are keeping the brain active and that they signed up to a scheme a few years prior, an experiment that people are encouraged to undertake and sign up to should they ever be in a state where death is imminent to carry out an experiment. You get paid for it, special insurance for the best healthcare, and all you do is agree to it should you ever be on the brink of death, but the brain is intact, and you give them DNA samples monthly. They did explain that they don't know why they were setting it up, because they said they had serious brain damage. Regardless, 
They seemed aware of everything that was happening outside of the coma. I remember sensations of panic and them trying to calm me down. I remember trying to ask so many questions about if this is real and what happens and for them to prove it to me. No words still, just feelings and images. It felt like they were inside my brain or I was inside theirs. It felt both foreign and familiar. Regardless, they told me a couple of things that were going on in my family at the time. I said I wanted proof of something that was incoming, something that when it happens, I can be sure this is real. I asked for lottery numbers. I felt amusement at this, probably theirs, like they tried to laugh. They told me they knew I was going to say that because they would. But they said that although they wouldn't remember them anyway, they would give me football scores and election results, but that they can't do that because I'm a gambler. I would bet on it and I might win a lot. This is where my emotions just went mental. I felt myself trying to cry. I felt dread, passion. They told me that they wouldn't do anything that could change the way my life goes. That might change the people we meet. They said that if this worked, they promised themselves they would never ever jeopardize our children being born. In that moment, I got it. There was a moment of understanding and I felt like I was actually speaking to myself. They got serious after this and said they had to pass on information. You're going to remember as much as you can and you're going to wake up. So you remember and write it down. I agreed to this. They told me that in the coming years, there's going to be research funded for the study of the possibility of transmitting information through brain cells, not just through space, but time as well. DNA based quantum entranglement. They added something else in there. I've tried so hard, it hasn't come to me, I'm so sorry. And they told me that when this is made public, be aware of it. Keep looking for the first story that pops up on it. And that I need to reach out to the lead researcher and give them some specific bits of information. I wrote as much of this down as I could remember upon waking up. I know for a fact I missed some, but got enough, I think. I won't post this because it contains personal details of an individual whom I do not know. And I was told to wait until this is made public. I remember scrambling inside my head to recount everything they told me. Basically, personal details of a person that had clearly been shared with myself, but someone's son. I'm assuming he's going to be the lead researcher when it comes, but it does contain specific instructions. They told me it's fragile, so don't even tell my brother. They know that's the one person I would go to about the instructions because they have to be handled in order. They told me to just keep going how I am. Everything works out. And then I got that feeling you get when you're trying to fall asleep and you feel like you're falling and then wake up just as you're about to hit the ground. And I was awake. I wrote down as much as I could and I didn't sleep any more that night. When I did finally sleep though, I woke up feeling pretty invigorated that my life's going to end up as something I'm happy with and not want to change. Even the opportunity of winning a shed load of money isn't tempting anymore. I'd love to hear anyone's thoughts and if anyone knows anything about the research possibly, if this even exists yet, please let me know. Like I said, there's a good chance this was momentary psychosis or the most intricate dream I've ever had, but there's a part of me that just knows. Me? My two dogs, and now my fiancé, drove a long way to get to our campsite in the Ozarks, Barkshed Recreational Area to be exact, and it was west of Mountain View, Arkansas. We drove all day Wednesday, May 19th, to get to our campsite and set up by dark. We are completely alone at the campground, as it's the middle of the week and the week before Memorial Day, and the camp we chose is a recreational area which means no electric hookups, water, or bathrooms, and definitely no camp itself. As we're setting up, I hear this bass-like rhythmic noise that I'm only noticing in my subconscious. I don't know why, but I'm feeling like something is wrong. 
he and I kept setting up our otherwise perfect campsite. Until I noticed both of our dogs staring across the small mountain river and into the forest beyond it. Then I asked myself, haven't I been hearing the strange noise coming from that direction? And now they hear it too? I asked my boyfriend to stop rattling tent stakes and lend his ear to this noise. He hears it, and the dogs are even more alerted to it since all the other noises, including literally all of the bugs, frogs and birds, not to mention our own unpacking noises and us chatting, have ceased. At first we wrote it off. It must be some new mountain noise that we just aren't accustomed to. We live in a relatively flat region of the country, and my boyfriend says it could be the rocks settling. I didn't think that was quite right, but I'm not about to go investigate at dusk in bear country before camp is set up. As we're putting the final touches up, like rugs and some solar string lights for the nights to come, the noise gets louder. I would say they were almost more comprehensible. They weren't just a bassy noise anymore. The noise had bass, but it wasn't just bass. It almost articulated, like it was making nonsensical syllables, then pausing, then making more. It got closer and closer, like it was coming towards the edge of the small river opposite us. And I swear on everything I love, that it was talking some strange static. Like you were stopped by a car with busted speakers at a stoplight, and they were blaring gothic trap music. But just the talking part, and with your windows up. No music, just loud, muffled, mumbling and static. I had a hard time not telling my boyfriend that we should just go. We had both heard it as well as the dogs. But it quickly got farther and then went away, almost completely. So we decided to zip ourselves up in the tents and try to sleep. I woke up many times during that first night to my female dog trembling and growling. And when I strained and listened, I could hear that same muffled bass noise in the distance once again. I did manage to sleep a few hours that first night and morning thankfully came before the noise could get closer again. The following three nights were completely normal. They were filled with sounds of tree frogs, bullfrogs, whippoorwills, cicadas and owls, just like you would imagine from the mountains at night. On Friday night, we got a couple neighbours camping with us and even more on Saturday. My boyfriend also proposed in the middle of a shallow river on our big 18 mile hike, and of course I said yes. Other than that strange, ominous noise that accompanied us on our first night, it was the best trip I could have asked for. I'm just wondering if anyone here might have a rational answer. Okay, so this happened in February 2021. I was 19 at the time and was in my last year of school and was shooting a music video for a final exam submission with my teammates. There were five of us in total. We were shooting in a suburban area where one of my friends lived. Two of the friends had gone back to my friend's house to get the camera as she had left it there to let it charge while she took us to the park. So I was sitting on a bench with one friend while the other was walking right in front of us, all of us just waiting for them to come back. It was around the time it got dark, but fairly bright. So I'm just sitting there in silence with my friend when I hear someone distantly shouting my name. I didn't live in the area, so I didn't think anything of it, figuring it was someone else with my name in the park being called out. This went on and on and got louder that I honestly got confused, like, what if it is me being called? So were my friends. I got up to see who it was and it was a middle-aged man wearing a white shirt calling out to me. When I looked at him, he knew who I was and motioned his hand towards me, you know, like beckoning me. I was extremely confused and there was obviously no way I was going to too near the man, but I did start walking towards him with my friend. He just shouted, pick up your phone your mom is calling you and I was like, what? Because my phone was in my pockets and I knew she wasn't calling me. Even then I checked. 
After saying that he got into his car and left, I hadn't even made it halfway through the distance between us. My friends thought it was someone I knew. And when I told them I had no idea who the fuck that guy was, they were as freaked as I was. The things I don't understand are, how did he know my name? I don't live in that area and nobody else had called me by my name since we were pretty much just focused on our task. The next thing is, why did he say what he said and spoke it in English? Where I'm from, English is not at all the conversational spoken language, especially weird from a middle-aged man. For me, what makes it even weirder is that I do speak English mainly because of my dad. But that's a whole other story that's not important. And the only thing that matters is that he spoke the language I mostly speak, in which nobody, never a stranger, would speak in this place at first conversations at all. And he referred to my mother as mom, which I guess is common, but again, that's what I specifically call her. It's not the usual term used here. I just don't get that if he was a weirdo, then why did he leave? Why did he beckon me towards him and then leave after telling me mom called? It was so weird. I had never seen the man before. My friends initially thought it was a relative of mine and were just as freaked as I was. Anyway, we had to shoot, so I didn't think much of it, so I just let it go to the back of my mind. I'm not scared by it, but I am perplexed by it. I can't seem to conclude whether it was paranormal or some super creep. I guess the only thing I can add, if it's worth mentioning, is that during that time I had become fairly agnostic and struggled with my faith in God a lot because I was studying advanced biology in school and I don't know, it just seemed to me that existence was just an evolutionary product. So in those one-on-one -on -one conversations you know you sometimes have with God, I asked God to send me a supernatural sign in front of a bunch of people because I didn't want to be spooked lol because I find supernatural things pretty convincing evidence of a higher power. At the same time, I feel like I'm just making things up because I want it to be like that. I just can't explain it. And I wanted to share this if anybody has some explanations or anything at all to say. To start off, I worked at an elderly home for more than a year. I'm turning 20 this year. This happened when I was 18. Keep in mind that English isn't my first speaking language. I've heard many things about the two elderly homes in the city I lived in. I learned the stories when I worked there from some of the workers and told me some scary stories they experienced and what visitors had told them. It wasn't exactly nerve wracking but there was a few creepy stories. An example that I've also witnessed was after an elderly person passed, their alarm would still be ringing, even though no one lived in that room anymore. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, the elderly people get an alarm for them to push on if they need help with something. We would see it on a clock slash board and go and help them. There shouldn't have been a reason for them to be ringing, really creepy but some people have different reactions to it. When I started to work there, my co-workers always let me do the more challenging work since I was new. That happens at every work when you're new and don't know anything. They all seemed scared or, you know, anxious about the basement. The part of the elderly that I was assigned to had their washroom down in the basement. Every part of the elderly home could have their clothes washed down there but since I worked at the part where the elderly home is at its oldest, I forgot to mention that. The building is two different houses, put together if that makes sense. One has been there since like the mid 1900s and the other part was built sometime in the 2000s. I worked in the oldest part where the wash room was in the basement. No one would will willingly go down there. But since I had no clue, they let me go. I'm sure they were like, if she doesn't know, it won't hurt her. If I didn't know then, I know now. There was always a creepy feeling in the basement, like someone was watching you. 
I knew in an instance why my coworkers were willing to send me down there. I always had music on, like old music, for apparent reason. It made me feel about better about it. The cleaning staff had their carts with cleaning stuff in the basements as well. While I listened to the music, I heard something fall over. I looked for the source and saw that a bottle on the cart had fallen over. I got out of there quickly. Another time, I was hanging white sheets to dry in that one room that heats up and is blowing. Don't know the name. When I was done, I turned around to turn the lights off. I swear I could see a faint shadow by the sheets, like behind it, like a contour. I got that scene from The Conjuring when Lorraine is taking down the laundry and I ran my ass back upstairs. I refused to leave anyone's side after that. They knew I was in the basement, so they probably didn't question me further about that. I'm not sure about that one. It was late. I hadn't slept well the whole week. Had watched scary movies and such. I'm a believer of the paranormal, so when someone tells a story about paranormal activity, I believe them. But the sheets were moving around, and since I was already frightened, it could have been whatever. I never told my co-workers about that one, but I did tell them about the feeling of being watched, things falling over and whatnot. This is the time they decided to tell me their stories and I was like, wow, couldn't have told me before. They thought I didn't see or hear anything since I never said anything before. I remember a time from that basement so vividly that even writing this makes my tears well up. I came in on a non-working day to talk with my boss about something. I don't really remember now. I asked my co-workers and they actually said that she was in the basement. We had flex, but okay. My boss had an encounter with another person with stocking of supplies or something like that, one of the co-workers said. So off I went to the scary basement. So when I got down there, I heard the voices from upstairs, but I also heard other voices. Like, it sounded like my boss. Seriously. I had walked a bit in, so you couldn't hear the others anymore from upstairs. I walked to a door. I heard someone talking behind it, thinking it was my boss and was like, oh, she's in there looking at supplies, right? Opens the door and instantly I'm met with darkness and the voice is gone. I looked inside at first, not realising it got all quiet. Then I got frightened by the darkness, shut the door hard and trotted away. I didn't realise it right away, however, that it stopped talking. I was just freaked out. Another time I was really freaked out was when I walked into an elderly woman who lived at the elderly home. I was going to give her the medicine she had at that time. So I walked in and she sat in her wheelchair, kind of facing her bed, and therefore could see me walking into her room. I said my hello and what I was doing, but she wasn't focused on me. She was kind of looking behind me. But I wasn't surprised, it's nothing new. I turned to my left to get her medicine, right by the door. When I did give her it, she stopped me and asked if I saw the man standing by the door. I looked at the door and it was cracked open a bit. I didn't fully close it and it was dark outside the door. We shut the light off at night and have like night lights along the corridors. You see a man standing at the door, I asked. Not right now, but when you walked in, he was right behind you, just staring into the room, she answered. That freaked me out. I mean, I'd gotten used to the weird feeling, but I must have noticed something, right? Maybe not. I walked towards the door and looked outside there was no one there. I hadn't heard anyone walking outside the door either. Many would probably say it's her mind playing tricks because of her age, but I've never heard her say something like that before. I asked her what the man looked like and she said that he looked like a fisherman, raincoat and a rain hat. I made sure she took her medication and walked to check with my colleagues if someone had been there, but they said no. The only visitors that had been there were at noon, no one else. I mentioned everything the lady said, and one of them said that the lady had an experience where someone tried to break in. My only thought was, 
who breaks in somewhere in a raincoat? She was a nerve wreck when I came back and said she wanted to have her doors locked that night. There is a fisherman picture a little away from the room, but I doubt that she imagined him being there. My grandmother lives at that elderly care. She said that she woke up one night and saw a man sitting in the chair in front of her bed and like watching over her. He too looked like the man the other lady mentioned. Raincoat and rain hat. Sus, isn't it? We think that he might have been a patient at the elderly care and watches out for everyone. A fisherman wouldn't be out of order really, since that city I lived in used to handle fishing as a living, if you know what I mean. This story took place a year ago, when we decided to have a vacation in Luxembourg for a few days. We were staying at my uncle's house, he lives in Luxembourg. Me, my mom and dad were given a room on the second floor. The room was close to the stairs. My uncle and aunt's room were right across from ours. Now, when we were putting our luggage in the room, I decided to take the bed farthest away from the door since there was a power socket right beside the bed and I tend to watch videos before going to sleep, so I need easy access to my charger. My mom took the middle bed and my dad the bed closest to the door and bathroom. Well actually, the real reason I wanted the bed farthest away was because right beside the bathroom door was a long lampshade. It's one of those old lampshades where the top looks like someone put an umbrella on it or something. That lampshade really gave me a bad feeling. At that time, I didn't really understand why I felt that way, just that I didn't want to be close to it at all. Now here's the creepy part that night. It was around 10 p.m. at night and I was still watching videos on YouTube. My mom and dad were sleeping already since we had a rough day of sightseeing and it was raining so we were all tired. I kept looking in that direction of where the lampshade stood. I felt stupid being paranoid to be honest. I just felt like something was there. When I look at that particular spot, it feels like it's darker in that area compared to the rest of the room. I tried my hardest to just focus on the video I was watching. It didn't work by the way. Around 20 minutes close to 11, I heard my mom whispering or whimpering. I don't know. I thought she was sleep talking. I thought she was having a weird dream. It happens to all of us sometimes. Five to 10 minutes later, she started whimpering louder. Now that got me worried, so I started shaking her trying to wake her up. She wouldn't. So I called for my dad who was right beside my mom's bed. Both of us started shaking her and calling her name. After a few seconds, that got her to wake up. My God, was she a mess. She was crying and kept looking at the spot where my, the lampshade stood. She kept telling my dad, that she wanted us to get out of the room. So my dad woke my uncle and told him we were sleeping downstairs in the living room since something happened with my mom and she doesn't want to sleep in the room anymore. We got her downstairs. I quickly went back to the room to get my phone from my bed. And I kid you not, when I turned around to leave, I saw on the spots where the lampshade stood. Something or someone stood behind that stupid lampshade peeking out at me. A literal black figure as big as the lampshade. Let's just say I ran out of that room as fast as I could. My mom explained to us downstairs what the hell she dreamt about. She told me she could see the room in a dream. She saw me using my phone and my dad asleep. But what caught her eye was something or someone that was standing behind the lampshade, staring at her apparently. She couldn't move, so she tried to apparently scream for us, and we couldn't hear her. That screaming is apparently me hearing her whimpering. She started panicking because she couldn't move, and that figure was giving off huge amounts of bad jujus. So she started screaming louder in a dream, where she saw me moving to her, shaking her, till my dad also joined in. And it's like she got slapped and she was awake. That creeped me out. Why? because I saw the same thing. I told them about me seeing the same thing when I went back to get my phone. 
my dad asked my uncle what the heck is up with that lampshade. He told us he doesn't know where the lampshade came from because they bought the house it was in the attic with the other furniture. My aunt thought it looked elegant so they put it in the guest bedroom which is where we slept. That night really solidified my belief of the paranormal and there are things out there that are good and that are bad. That thing, whatever it was, was by no means good. My uncle threw that lampshade away. That's what he told us months later when my mom asked him about it. I am never sleeping at my uncle's house again. For the rest of our stay, we slept in the living room and we never went inside that room during our stay. But every time I go to my uncle's room to play some PS4, I always get a bad feeling where the guest bedroom is. I don't know what that thing is, but I don't really want to know. I've never been super involved in the supernatural world. I've always believed in ghosts and I've seen a few over my lifetime. I usually try to analyze things from a scientific standpoint and debunk them for my own sanity. However, I had an encounter recently that left me feeling confused and unsure. I've never played with the idea of humans not being human before, but I think I might have encountered one. I decided I wanted to go for a walk in a very isolated forest the other day. It's about a 30 minute drive from my small town, so I almost never see anybody else there. When I arrived in the dirt parking lot, there were no other vehicles, as expected. The forest is filled with giant cedars, and the foggy chilly day made it incredibly beautiful, but eerie at the same time. About 20 minutes into the forest, I see a person. It was a lady wearing a large sun hat, a dress, and carrying a wooden basket. I was curious what she had in her basket, and where she may have come from, as the only parking area had no other vehicles. I was planning on saying hello and asking what she was gathering as we passed. She was walking towards me, but never lifted her head to look at me. Her face was completely concealed by the large sun hat. I found this strange, as usually people will look when someone is walking towards them, especially a lady walking alone in the woods. As we got closer, still without raising her head so I could see her face, she took a 90 degree corner and walked off into the forest off the path. I thought this was strange, but continued my walk. As I was returning about 10 minutes later, she was still in the same general area as before. She was facing away from me and kneeled down. She looked like she was picking mushrooms and placing them in her basket. As soon as I got about as close as I did the first time without looking back, she stood up and walked directly into the woods again off the trail. I looked at the area where she was kneeled and there was nothing there. No signs of mushrooms or anything. Almost concerned at this point, I said hello as I was walking past. She turned around with her head down so I couldn't see her face and stood there looking at the ground but in my direction. Her basket was empty and she never looked up, always hiding her face with the large hat. She didn't say anything back. As I walked off, she kneeled down again to start collecting something. The more I think about this encounter, the more I'm convinced it was not a strange human, but some sort of spirit who didn't like me being there. So, to set it up, during one weekend while my friend's mum and sister were out shopping and such, I went over to her place just to chill and do what 13 year olds do. Jump on the trampoline and play with her doggos, duh. Eventually getting bored from being outside, we decided to play hide and seek in the house. To set up the house it took in as best I can, she had two living rooms and the kitchen was in the middle of these. The carpet living room was to the far left, the tile living room was to the far right, and that's the one you see when you walk into the house. Clear view all the way down the hall when you get toward the kitchen. 
A wall separated the kitchen from the hallway, but you could still go around to get to the kitchen and living rooms. And then down the hall was the laundry, bathrooms, bedrooms, all that. And my friend's room was adjacent to the wall that separated the kitchen. She was closest to the front door. Everything was tile except the bedrooms and the left living room, so it was easy to hear people walking around. So I'm the hider, she's the seeker. She starts counting in the living room to the left. I immediately hide in her room and get under the bed with the door shut. I hear, ready or not. A few seconds later, she proceeds to go down the hall to the rooms. A few more seconds pass and a door is heard being opened, followed by a triumphant, gotcha. Silence follows. Gentle but panicked footsteps are heard coming back up the hall. She quietly opens her bedroom door, shuts it, and then climbs under the bed with me. You know how whenever Shaggy and Scooby saw a ghost and they would get all fear-stricken and white in the face? Pretty much how she looked. And when I went to ask her what was wrong, we both froze and held our breath as we heard slow, heavy footsteps coming up the hallway and they stopped right in front of the door. We genuinely thought someone had broken in because we saw a shadow on the other side and then realized there was no way to get into the house besides the front door or the garage door, which we would have heard or seen. It eventually went away, so we immediately got up and out, grabbed the scooters by the front door and got the fuck out. Once we were far enough away from the house, she told me she thought she had seen me running into the laundry, but wasn't entirely sure, so she checked it out anyway. It was small and quick enough to be me, I guess, so why not? And then nothing was there. That's when she freaked out and hid with me. While reciting this story to a friend I had over last year, she said something that actually scared me a lot more. What if my friend saw was hiding, running away from something else? And that's why we heard those heavy footsteps coming up the hall. What if there were two ghosts and the smaller one? Just wanted a safe place to hide. I have a spirit in my house. Or multiple. I'm not sure. And I'm not sure which I prefer. It first started when my family bought this house. We think the previous owner used a Ouija board and that it's laying under my sister's room. When I was younger, she experienced all the things, like my cats being pushed over after looking at it, dropping stuff, etc. She saw it close our locked laundry door. I used to wake up with random bruises, but whatever. My first encounter was when it imitated my sister. I got home, called out hi, and got a response back. Ten minutes later, she walked through the front door. There's no way she could have gone around without being seen or heard. Then a couple months later, I was sitting on my couch and I saw a spirit over the mattress. And it wasn't one of those situations where you see something out of the corner of your eye. There was a presence behind that, along with genuine 100% fear. A couple of weeks after that, I grabbed the Mac from my dad's shed. Whenever I'm alone there, I feel like I'm not. When I came in, I thought I heard a little girl's voice, which I thought came from my neighbor's house, grandkids. No one came or went that day. A couple weeks after that, I had my mates come over for a birthday sleepover. And while helping my friend when they were having a diabetic hypo, I felt like I was being actively watched and depressed. Then a few days ago, I saw something move behind the bar. And I don't say this lightly, but God, the thing behind there wasn't the little girl. Either there are two spirits in my house, one being a little girl and one being potentially malicious, or there is one spirit who disguised itself as a little girl, and it is powerful enough to oppress me and hide its presence. If this is a dangerous, please help, I beg. When 
When I was aged about two to five, my family lived in a house that I'm convinced was haunted. I would have recurring nightmares almost every night. Toys would mysteriously move by themselves. I felt like I was never alone. Every time I think about that house, I feel like crying. There are a few other incidents that stand out though. I remember having this imaginary friend named Elizabeth. I think it was a ghost instead of just a friend my mind had made up. I felt her presence, but I don't remember ever seeing her. When I heard her voice, it was always annoyed or angry. I remember a few times she would tell me to do things, such as throwing toys at people, pushing glasses off table, tearing up a Bible, and I would do it because I was scared of her. My, the most memorable incident was when my mother was in the hospital, giving birth to my sister. My father was in the hospital with her while my grandmother stayed behind to watch me. I was three at the time and was upset as I couldn't understand why my parents had left me alone for the night. My grandmother put me to bed and went to sleep in her room. I was crying so much I threw up, so I went to get my parents, forgetting they weren't home. I knocked on their bedroom door and a tall black figure of a man opened it. I had thought it was my father at the time, but looking back, the figure was too tall to my father and I never saw the figure's face. The figure spoke a much deeper, thundering voice than my father's. It snarled at me to stop crying and to go to bed and it went back into the room. I remember being terrified and running back to my room. That was the only time I saw the figure. Fast forward, I'm at dinner with my family and the conversation turns to the old house we used to live in. I told them about how I thought it was haunted and telling them about how my father, the figure, yelled at me when I was up crying that night. My mother was confused and said, she was in the hospital with my father, so that wasn't possible. I never thought much about it before, since my father was an asshole, and I wouldn't put it past him to snap at younger me like that. I realised that it in fact wasn't my father. My mother commented that she always had a strange feeling about that house. I'm a person who was very into lucid dreaming and is searching to have my first one. I've had a dream journal for about two years because of that. This is why I wrote this dream down. I have a lot of dreams about other things that are striking as well, but this is the most insane of them all. The time I predicted my aunt's cancer. I haven't seen my aunt in over 10 years at this point of this dream. When my grandfather died, all four of his daughters broke apart. Huge legal battles occurred and my family vowed to never see that side of the bloodline ever again. And that's how it was for 10 years. No communication, no texting, no birthday phone calls, not even anything from my cousins. I was 14 at the time, not a mature adult. So it was hard to make my own decision to speak to them, even if I wanted to. That part of my family was over, or so I thought. In August 2020, I had a dream so jarring that I woke up in tears. This is what I wrote down. Dream where I was given a day to prepare for surgery. I had a feeling I wasn't going to survive. It was for my uterus. I had cancer, sick. Lots of stressful crying and thinking about death. Horrible dream. The entire dream felt like ages, but it was all suffering and anxiety. That's sadly all the details I put down. It just felt so real, so raw, but I didn't feel me during the dream. I could just feel the stress and anxiety and fear. Anyway, fast forward to September 2020. My mother tells me to have a seat. She needed to talk. Jay, aunt, was sick. She had gone into a shock while bringing groceries inside her condo. According to her neighbour, she just stood outside looking at her front door for 10 minutes, not responding. Her neighbour and best friend thankfully saw this, went, oh shit, 
and went to help her. She guided Jay into her home and sat her down. This is when she went almost completely comatose and passed out multiple times. The ambulance was called and she kept having these jolting moments of consciousness. Confusion was infesting her mind it seemed. She had no idea what was even going on or where she was. She went for testing while in the hospital and was told there was something very wrong. She had cancer of the uterus or at least the doctors thought. Immediately she had to go through testing and screenings. The cancer was so bad there was nothing they could do but remove it all, hysterectomy. As if they didn't, it would travel to her stomach and eventually kill her. I didn't know the term at the time of my dream, just as I remember knowing my uterus has to be removed. During all of this, Jay was so positive, so grateful for life. She was amazing. The operation went well, after of course going through many months of chemo. I'm happy to say she has made an almost full recovery. Unfortunately, the type of cancer she has slash had was fallopian tube cancer. The survival rate, even after operation, is only five to 10 years. Because of this cancer, I reunited with my family. All is well now, and I'm so blessed to be with them. I told my mother I had this dream, and she said she believed me. I told her right after she informed me of Jay's health. My mom told me that all of the women on her side have had these abilities to pre pre predate things in dreams, deaths, cancers, etc. The women of my family have also felt this pull of wanting to go home, despite being home. I believe it may be blood related thing. I'm not sure. I try not to talk about it too much as it makes my mom very anxious. The only one I can talk to about this is another aunt of mine, P, who is a lifelong researcher of finding out the truth of what life really is. Something that I had no idea she did, thanks to the 10 year gap of them not being in my life. And what boggles my mind is that I do the same thing, research NDEs, past lives, etc. Just as my aunt P does, yet I wasn't introduced to it by her at all. I found it naturally. Such a small niche and study, and yet here I am doing the same thing she has been doing. Weird how it all connects. My great uncle owns a lot of land in northern Saskatchewan, Canada. Some of this was pasture that he uses for cattle. But half of one of his largest properties is fenced off and the cows can't go there. In the sectioned off lactose free zone, the entire place is densely packed with foliage. I mean, when I hunt, I almost only use game trails and small clearings because a lot of the brush is too thick to get through without a machete. The ground itself is blotted with some small steep hills towards the entrance of the property. There is one main dirt road that goes from a Texas gate at the entrance all the way back to the farthest side of the property. Coming off the road in the hilly area, we have a camp. The camp consists of a camperized Atco trailer. Picture a big ass yellow sea can in front of the entrance, gated with barbed wire because sometimes my uncle will move his cattle to different fenced off areas of the land. With my mother's pull behind trailer, that we can't pull anymore, sitting perpendicular to the Atco and a tiny dinghy 70s, 14 foot pull behind that a family member gave me so I could have privacy at camp and not have to sleep with my mom. Needless to say, we spend a lot of time in the woods and both my mom's and my door were facing the direction of the Atco, meaning I had a suedo alleyway between my door and my mom's wall. And finally, in front of the Atco trailer, we have a fire pit. And close next to it in front of my mom's place, there is a table for food prep. We've always had lots of wildlife, like big cats and bears that could harm people. I actually had to put down a bear that came into our camp 
and was far too comfortable with people not too long after. So from so since I was young, I learned to recognize the sounds and sights around me. And while cautious, I'm rarely afraid of anything out there, especially given that I'm usually armed when I'm not with multiple people. The summer before last, we had a remarkably calm experience there, where hardly any critters we had to deal with, and it seemed the bears and pests were leaving us alone. No droppings, many small game trails had grown in, and the camp that usually took two days to set up was exactly how we had left it the previous trip. It was peaceful. It being summer, I filled the days with woodworking, fishing trips, and the occasional hike looking for berries and setting traps for rabbits, grouse, and other small game that could be prepared quickly over the fire with. My family, but mostly came up unlucky. Regardless of the seeming lack of disturbances, we always were careful at night, making sure to have a bright light and keep lookout for anything. After the first week, we began hearing noises around the camp very late at night that would drive the dog insane all night, to the point we just had to keep her inside, but never saw anything. It almost felt like whatever it was, was probing and checking out our camp nightly, but always staying far enough away and hidden enough that we could never see it with our spotlights. Then one night, just like any other, by the eerie quietness that usually came around that time, I left my mother's camper a couple hours after the daylight had. Disappeared with a lantern style LED light, and as a rarity, I didn't have anything to defend myself. No gun, no bear spray, not even a knife. So I was a little bit more cautious and observant than usual, given I felt more vulnerable. As I walked from the exit of my mom's camper, I looked around for a minute, scanning the tree line, and then began to loop around to my door. I panned as I walked from right to left from the entrance to the fire pit, and then to the table. It was there, just behind the table, not 20 feet away, that I saw a naked, extremely pale, almost grey, probably just because of the dark, lanky humanoid figure standing still and directly facing me. As it caught my gaze, I felt my heart drop and immediately went cold. I probably only stared for three seconds at most, but it felt like several minutes as my brain processed what I was seeing. It stood somewhere between six and a half and seven and a half feet tall, with low slumped shoulders and had a frail thin body that reminded me of photos from the Holocaust, but with disproportionately long limbs. I couldn't see the legs fully because of the table, but what I could see looked like sinew and skin stretched over the leanest and thinnest body I have ever seen. I know I might be sounding like a dramatic bitch, but I couldn't describe the primal fear and shock that came over me. It was like a combination of the feeling you get being threatened at gunpoint, and hearing someone talk, stalk you in the woods, but ramped up to the point where I could barely think. I couldn't make out many details of the face, but the light cast small shadows on the face that made it look like it had shallow features similar to a nose and lips and eye sockets that were smoothed down. Almost like Voldemort and Slenderman's love child. I ran like my life depended on it. To be honest, I thought it might have. The last few feet to my door. Once inside, I grabbed my shotgun stuffed several shells in my pocket, loaded the gun, aimed it at the door. I sat in silence with the hammer and walked back waiting for the doorknob to turn or the frosted glass to break. I sat and waited for hours into the early morning, expecting to see or hear something, but I never did. Not even any foliage moving or items moving. Eventually around 4am, I lowered my guard, propped the shotgun next to my bed and hesitantly went to sleep. When I woke up, hardly believe in what I seen the night before, I was around the area to see if there was any shapes or items that I could have mistaken, and warped in my mind into the creature. I saw, but the only thing in that area was a table with some pots and pans on it, that were blackened from the fire. 
I'm still not quite sure what to make of it, but I do have some ideas from what I witnessed. Given the fact that I believe it was stalking us and staking out our camp for several nights, along with positioning itself between me and my mother's camp, directly in front of the path that I took every night, leads me to believe that it has some level of intelligence, comparable to low A person laying a trap or setting something up. As I mentioned, I looked around after exiting my mother's camper and never heard anything which tells me that either it was waiting there, watching, or it's so incredibly quiet that I never heard it move. Even a leaf. Which wouldn't line up with us hearing the disturbances from the previous nights. It also left as quietly as it appeared, which leaves three options. Either it went out of its way to use the same road entering the camp that a person would for convenience, it silently crept out through the game trails, or it didn't wave until after I had lowered my guard and my adrenaline died down. I'm honestly not sure which option is more likely or more off-putting. I'm not really sure what I saw, but I know it wasn't human. The photos and drawings of these crawlers reminded me a great deal of it. So I thought I'd share that maybe one of you could enlighten me as to what it could have been doing or its intent, or provide an explanation to its behavior. I know it's not worth much online, but hand to God, I swear this isn't a piece of fanciful writing, and I would be happy to share any other details if anyone wants more info or further clarification. When I messed around with the Ouija board with my siblings, it would always say mysterious things like Anon is a poo-poo head. Very discouraging. But I didn't let the heckling of these mysterious spirits stop me. I started a journal of potentially paranormal happenings. Most of it's circumstantial and easily explained away. Odd noises, shadows that don't look quite right, animals acting strange, and shapes in the woods that seem to disappear before I got close. I'm sure some of you would lend more credence to a host of odd things happening over your childhood, but personally, I think the mind sometimes sees what it wants to see, and so I remain sceptical. And well, that's really how it stayed until I met my Uncle Kevin. You see, my family is very, very, very Irish. A decent amount of us fought in the Civil War, and I have IRA relatives, but my uncle was unique even among all that. You see, he was a druid. I'm not talking about a hippie college druid who smokes way too much weed. I'm talking about a large man with a beard in his 60s, who meets with other old people to perform legitimate pagan rituals, mixed with a bit of the good old Irish Christianity. I'm not certain exactly how he reconciles the two, but I suppose through faith, anything is possible. Like me, he had a deep interest in the paranormal, Although with him, I suppose you could call it a more professional interest. He introduced me to some of our old ways, among them the Irish language and our old mythologies. The way he went on about traditions and our old practices made me feel comfortable talking to him about my own thoughts and experiences. I showed him my journal, told him about my forays into the dense Canadian forests and the stories I had read online. To my surprise, he took it all in his stride. I was expecting him to laugh me off or even get all serious and tell me to stop jerking around. Instead, he told me to keep it up, keep going hard at what I was passionate about. But he did give one serious warning. Be careful when interacting with the unknown. Kevin told me that he had met creatures from the fairy world several times and it was his duty as a druid to keep the balance between our world and theirs. Just some context, we Irish seem to refer to absolutely everything paranormal as fairies. Ghosts, changelings, even the leprechaun are all fairies. Anyway, on the topic of fairies, Uncle Kevin told me that as a child, he was marked by the fairy world, and that's why he took up the mantle of a druid. Now to be warned, my uncle fully believes what I'm about to share, 
And while I do trust that he believes what he's saying, I think there could be other explanations. Apparently, as a child, fairy circles would appear around him if he stepped outside. Basically a circle of mushrooms. He could often see odd figures in the distance that would disappear if pointed out. It was mundane things like that, until we got to the topic of his father, a cruel man from what I've heard. After a particularly hard beating, a sudden shriek exploded across the old Irish countryside, shattering all the glass objects in their poor old hut. The smell of old wrath and smoke penetrated through the old rotten doors, and my uncle was struck with an overwhelming urge to flee. Leaping from the hands of his now extremely distracted father, he burst out the door, running for the safety of the distant hills. Looking back, he saw the old bog behind their house had burst into a thousand tiny flames, dotting as far as he could see. Individually insignificant, but their combined power assaulted my uncle with an overwhelming stench and rush of smoke, making it hard for him to see or breathe. It's at this point of the story that he stops, looks at me, and makes me promise to take what he is about to say next very seriously. Of course, I'm ecstatic. This is what I've been looking for, so I eagerly nod, excited to hear what would happen next. When he peered into the hellscape that was engulfing his house, he thought he saw something along all the tiny flames. Well, more accurately, Someone. A figure draped in tattered rags, with a hood pulled up around its head. When my uncle saw it, the thing leant back and let out an ear-piercing wail. Longer than the original, forcing my uncle to cover his ears to escape from the sudden pain. Not that it helped much, the scream apparently felt like it was drilling into his head. It's here that my uncle ends the story abruptly. He apparently didn't remember that much afterwards, only that his father was very angry with him, and no fire ever seemed to take place. What he saw was dismissed as hallucinations, introduced from the beatings or just lies. Even the broken glass might have just been his dad breaking the shit in their house. What is interesting is that soon afterwards his father ended up dying of some sort of illness, which my uncle attributed to the fairy folk. Now obviously, there's plenty of room for doubt here. It may just be the invention of an abused mind. And like what I said before, the mind sees what it wants to see. After this, I had to give my uncle a day to recover. Telling the story had apparently brought back some bad memories. And he just spent the next few hours just sitting and reading through some old book about identifying plants. He's a big man with a big heart. And every day he tries his hardest not to be like his father. So I gave him some time, and it was a day later when I took him to the edge of the forest that started in my journal. We made a fire and sat by the woods for a bit, making some western-style bannock, and just chatting generally about spooks and spirits. Like I said before, my uncle considered himself a keeper of the peace between the worlds, and especially keeping the peace sometimes involved evicting troublesome guests. For the most part, we apparently live alongside the fairy folk without even noticing them. But occasionally, they act up and my uncle has to show them the metaphorical door. Something along the lines of an exorcism, but my uncle stressed the two practices were quite different. In his own words, he doesn't drive out demons or free souls from evil. He merely gently, yet very firmly, gets troublesome fairies to leave and he only deals with the supernatural that he is familiar with. When I asked him if he could deal with a local creature, like maybe a wendigo or a skinwalker, he flatly said no. He had no real experience or idea of the habits, strengths, weaknesses or history of those creatures, and attempting to apply what worked in Ireland might just be a shot in the dark. According to him, acting in these situations without prior preparation and knowledge would sometimes be fatal, especially considering the darker reputation of some cryptids. Nothing much happened while we were at the edge of the woods, as per usual. The bannock was good. 
If you haven't had a chance to try some campfire banner, you should really make a point of doing so. Eventually, we decided to pack up. My uncle had to visit more relatives before he went back to Ireland, and I still had a bedtime at that point. Besides, the forest was getting real quiet. Dark clouds were gathering, and the wind was starting to pick up the snow. All sure signs that some sort of storm was coming. My uncle wasn't used to the big storms we got, and I remember him looking around rather concerned and insisting we go. Probably dreading walking back in heavy snowfall. You might think I'm trying to lead up to a spooky bit here about walking away and looking back to see an ominous tall man in the trees, but no, most we got was a lone deer walking out of the woods and keeping an eye on us. Nothing out of the ordinary in Western Canada. He departed the next day for BC and our extended family over there, but he left me an old bird identification book and one of his cross necklaces, which were very nice of him. I wish we had more time. I barely get to see him and his stories really ignited my passion for cryptids and the supernatural. Since then, I've grown up quite a bit. No more bedtime, for example. I constantly go out looking for the supernatural, but perhaps I'm just not touched by the fairy folk in the same way my uncle is. I have some experiences that I cannot discredit, and I feel like I've had more of those ever since my uncle visited. But I'm still missing the big cat that I've been looking for. It's like when you see something just on the edge of your vision, and you turn to see nothing there. It feels like they're around me, but I'm just too stupid to notice or not fast enough to catch them. I came here looking for advice and maybe some stories on what best to do to interact and document any potential cryptids. Particularly the ones locals to the rocky area. And if I happen to piss off a particularly dangerous cryptid, perhaps some tips on how not to die. I'm an American Civil War reenactor. I was attending an event deep in North Carolina cotton country at the beginning of November, where we set up camp in the original fort that was on site. One of the things reenactors do to add some authenticity to events is to send out four to five guys on what's called picket duty. It's basically a safety watch that stands guard outside of camp at night. I wasn't too terribly tired that night so I volunteered to be one of the four sentries to go and stand watch that night. Now, before we go to our respective posts, we all determine a call sign, so that way, should anyone come up to us, they can call out the call sign, make their presence known, and other camp. Our call sign for that night was O Virginia. Fast forward about two hours or so, it's now approximately 1.30 or 2 a.m., I was posted along a stretch of trenches leading up to the main ford, about 25 yards outside of camp. I was leaning against a tree, letting my mind wander, when I saw movement coming from a section of woodline. A figure emerged and began slowly making his way towards me. I snapped to the position of port arms and said to the figure, Halt and make your presence known. The figure stopped only for a breath before saying, I am friendly. The figure came up to me and he revealed himself to be a middle-aged man in confederate garb with sergeant stripes on the sleeves of his dirty jacket. I distinctly remember a strong sense of pipe tobacco coming from him. He made a brief bit of small talk with me asking how my post was going, did I kill any Billy Yanks, so on and so forth. As he finished his conversation and began to turn, he looked back and said, got enough rounds in your box? Referring to my leather cartridge box that held my blank reenactor rounds for my muskets. I only had a few days left for the next day's event, so I said if he was offering, I could definitely use a few more. He dug around in his pockets for a second and produced three cartridges and placed them in my hand. Immediately, I knew they were live rounds. I felt the weight of the lead bullets in my hands. This is a serious no-no, as you are not allowed by any means whatsoever to bring live ammunition or bullets to a reenactment event. 
I stared at the cartridges in my hands for a moment, and when I looked back up to say that I could not accept these, the soldier was gone. All that was left was the smell of sweet pipe tobacco. I pocketed the rounds, finished my guard shift, and in the morning I put the three live rounds in my truck. I still have them now. I made a point of looking for that sergeant the following day, but to no avail. To this point, I'm unsure of the circumstances. Could it have been a fellow reenactor playing a joke? Someone trying to cause issues? Or maybe, potentially, a sergeant from a time long ago since past was keeping an eye out for a fellow soldier late at night. Whoever you are, sergeant, you stuck with me. Let's not meet under these circumstances again. I had a pretty scary experience with my husband. This happened about a year and a half ago. I've always been a huge paranormal fanatic. I would always find places to go explore that were known to be haunted, which means I have a lot of stories, but this one is by far my most scary. In my home state, there's an abandoned asylum on the outskirts of downtown, in a pretty sketchy area. The building was originally a mental health facility in the 40s, and was eventually made into a drug rehab center, and finally a boy's home where it would eventually shut down in the 80s. It's a relatively small building, only two stories, and maybe eight rooms on each floor, and one large room on both floors on the far side of the building, all windows busted out. The building has a history filled with tragedy, and has a well-known reputation to be haunted. I've been to the building on a handful of occasions, but had never been on the bottom floor due to flooding. I had never had any experiences there except maybe a feeling of unease. There was a day I had asked my husband if we could go. He was hesitant at first, as we had been there a few months before. We usually went every six months just for fun. But he eventually agreed and said he wanted to go at 3am. Me being me, I agreed with him. 2am rolls around and we're at the asylum with our baseball bats. For protection. As I mentioned, in sketchy areas occasionally we'd run into homeless sleeping there, so it's just a precaution. I also had brought a Ouija board and an EMF reader. This time that we visited, the water on the bottom floor had drained out and I was very excited to finally go down there and explore it. We started upstairs and swept the whole building, making sure nobody was there. While sweeping the bottom floor, I didn't have any feelings of unease, but I was a little freaked out to see satanic symbols and dead birds on the floor. At this point, I had figured that the downstairs hadn't been flooded for a few months, as there was a lot of graffiti and the dirt on the floor was dry. We started on the upstairs with candles and the Ouija board, and tried to make contact for nearly an hour. Nothing. Nothing on the EMF, nothing on the board. At this point, my husband and I are just bullshitting around because we weren't expecting anything to happen, just having fun. We moved downstairs and by that time it was about 3am. I was feeling fine at first and we did a few sessions on the Ouija board in different areas of the lower floor. I had asked to stay away from the large back room as the satanic symbols had made me uncomfortable. After the sessions, we walked around with the EMF detector and I noticed it was only spiking in the spots we had the Ouija board sitting. My husband and I were pretty weirded out, but we just kind of blew it off and thought there was maybe an explanation. My husband decided he wanted to go to the back room. I said it was fine as long as he stayed close to me. We made it a little more than halfway when I started to get a gut feeling to not go any further. Every hair on my body was standing on end. I told my husband that we needed to go and I noticed he was on edge as well. I ended up running down the hall back to the outside alone. It was unlike me to go anywhere alone in the dark, as I'm terrified of it, but this feeling was too much for me. When my husband and I were both back in the car and I had calmed down, he explained to me that he had felt the most evil feeling or presence he had felt since a previous haunting he had dealt with. We were both pretty freaked out and decided we were done for the night and wanted to go home. 
About three nights later, I woke up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. When I was coming back from the bathroom, I had a weird feeling, but I wasn't completely awake so I ignored it. When I reached the bedroom and closed the door behind me, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I looked over to the corner of our room and I saw a hunched shadow figure, not much taller than my 5'4". I stared for a second but told myself I was half asleep and went back to bed feeling a little uneasy. About a week later, my husband asked to talk to me. He told me that he had seen something in the bedroom the night I had gotten up to use the bathroom as I had woken him up getting out of bed. He began describing what he saw and I was in utter disbelief because we had both seen the exact same thing. When I asked why he didn't say anything that night, he said he thought he was imagining it. Needless to say, we were both scared shitless after that and I think our fear fed more into the situation. It went to us seeing the figure almost every other night, our ankles being grabbed and things being moved around and found out of place for the next few weeks. There came a point when I was so fed up that I smudged with two different smudge sticks and very angrily told it to leave us the fuck alone. After that, it just went away. Gone. Like it never happened. To this day, I believe it followed us home from the asylum, as we have never had issues in our house before and always left the Ouija board in the car. I had a strict rule about it coming into the house. Do I think the spirit was the same entity we felt that night? No, but I definitely felt it came from the asylum. I think this was a spirit that just wanted to mess with us, nothing malevolent. To this day, we haven't returned to the asylum. Even thinking about it over a year later, I can still feel the pit in my stomach of when I felt that evil entity that night. Okay, so all of this happened between the ages of 7 and 10 for me. I'm 21 now and still wonder what was happening to me. When I was young, I was really tuned into the paranormal and that since has faded. For a few years, things were really crazy for me. From seeing things to hearing voices and feeling a lot of strong and unexplained emotions, plus really scary and vivid dreams. The first time this specific thing happened to me, I was probably seven or eight. So how this experience would start would be I was in bed trying to settle down for the night and I would have a really bad feeling. I would eventually fall asleep and wake in the middle of the night with a feeling of complete terror and having a tingling sensation all over my body. Here's the catch though. What would wake me up would be the sound of someone digging through the toys in my closet. Terrifying. So when I heard the noise, I would get out of bed and start walking to my parents' room. But the moment I would make it halfway across my bedroom, a large black figure would lunge at me, growling very loudly. I always had a nightlight, which was how I saw it. Every time it lunged at me, I would immediately pass out and wake the next morning on my parents' bedroom floor. This continued for a few years, about three times a month, and didn't stop until one night. I just didn't get out of bed and laid there until the feeling of terror subsided. To this day, I'm still incredibly traumatized about it and think about it happening every night before bed. I also believe this is what caused my extreme fear of the dark because before this, I could manage without a nightlight. I've tried Googling this, but never figured out what it was. I considered sleep paralysis, but I don't think that's what it was because I could move. My husband thinks it was a demon because he experienced something similar in his teens when he had a demon living with him. Every year when we get the first solid snowfall, I head out to the trees beside my in-laws house to get my pine boughs for my Christmas wreaths. To give some context, my in-laws live in a rural area on 100 acres. When you go up the driveway and kennels are on the right, there's a barn straight ahead and to the left is the house. The house has fields right beside it and they extend back behind the barn. There's a huge bush, 20 to 30 acres of trees at the back of the field. 
If you walk past the house to the left, you can walk along the edge of the field. The field drifts to the right and to your left it is a small patch of dense trees and a pretty steep embankment down to the road level. I packed up my dogs, Kaiju, Echo and Kivli, three Alaskan Malamutes. You guys thought they were instrumental in my making home safely from the last time I was out in the forest, so I bring them with me every time I go out into the forest now. Kaiju is a big guy weighing about 120 pounds, not a chunky guy. This is just a solid dog. Echo has grown up a bit since our last outing and is almost as big as Kivli now. I get everyone out of the car and since this is a family property, they know very well and they all have fantastic recall. We go off leash. I brought an offering of tobacco, as suggested by my dear friend who gave me some incredible insight from an indigenous Canadian perspective. I made my offering in a safe place where my dogs wouldn't find it and where other animals couldn't get to it, and listened as I was instructed. I didn't have any feelings of immediate fear or anxiety, so I thanked the forest spirits, again as instructed, and we made our way down to the pine trees. I cut my bows from the bottom of the trees and made sure to only take what I needed. I tried to take the branches that are blocking out the smaller trees growing under or near them. I was putting my cuttings into a bag and I felt like something was off. Keiju, who normally does his usual perimeter to pee on every tree in sight, was sitting no more than five feet from me, facing the tree line on the embankment, totally still. So still that snow was collecting on his fur and was totally undisturbed. This made me take an inventory of my dogs. Echo, who bless her heart, is a total spaz when she's off leash. She has to be running absolutely everywhere, it's like she's afraid she won't get to see everything unless she runs everywhere as fast as she can. She was also sitting completely still, directly beside me, staring towards the embankment. Kivli was the furthest away, maybe 10 to 12 feet, standing, head low, ears up, tail straight down behind her. I immediately thought it must be a deer. There's a heavily used, well-worn game trail down here, and these guys love to watch the deer. I still have a nagging feeling something isn't quite right, so I pack up a little faster. Then I hear it. Kaiju is growling. Kaiju never growls. He's a giant teddy bear. The scariest noise he makes is a Chewbacca sound and that's just adorable. But now, he's definitely growling. Kivli is circled back, head still low. If you need a visual, think stalking wolf. And she's grumbling too. Echo is now standing up, hackles up, baring her teeth. Message received, kids. We're out of here. I grab my bag, check my exit options, and start walking briskly towards the closest trail up the embankment. Keiju's up front, Kiv and Echo on either side. And I realised, the trees are silent. No birds, no wind, no nothing. It's like we're in a sound vacuum. Kaiju is now stopped dead and is staring straight down. There's a skull. Not sure what it is. Could be a deer. Could be a calf. Honestly not sure what it could be. I have photos to help hopefully identify what it was I was looking at. In a link below. In a small, shallow, for lack of a better description, grave. No other bones. Just the skull. A very clean skull. Kaiju's growling again and he's got his teeth out this time. I noticed up the embankment, there was what looked like a makeshift shelter. This shelter was directly overlooking the hole with the skull in it. All of my dogs are losing it now. They're full on howling now, which is being answered by the other three dogs up at the kennel. It was eerie. It was like they were trying to call for reinforcements. I got an overwhelming urge to be still. Like something was trying to wrap me in a blanket to hide me. All I could get out was the word Nack, night in German, which is what I usually use to tell my dogs to watch me. They all stopped howling, but hackles stayed up and low growls kept going. As soon as the blanket feeling was gone, we ran. I've been to that cluster of trees a hundred times. I've never found bones of anything down there. I've never felt like I'm being watched and I've never been scared to be there. 
we regularly plant new seedlings down there and clear out the grapevine from the older trees so they don't get choked out. We put out peanut butter pine cones with bird seed for the birds in the winter and keep the hunters out of that area so the animals have a safe place to rest. To preface this story, I live on a dead end street that's tucked away by several side streets. Never any issues with break ins or anything. I'd always been hearing footsteps at night around that time, either in the hallway or the attic. Had previous paranormal interactions at younger ages after deaths in my family. I was not well connected with these people. But late summer day, 14 years old, sitting in my living room doing my summer reading. Only one home is my older brother in our room, which faces our front yard. Living room and kitchen are connected and my house is not very large, so let's say the window is about 20 to 30 feet from where I'm sitting. The kitchen window is also facing my front yard and I live in a one story house. The house is dead silent. There are no lawn mowers or anything going outside. Sun's out maybe 2 or 3 p.m. A picture perfect summer day. I remember it so clear because right as I was shaking off that uneasiness of being alone, I hear from my kitchen window, hey. I look up in disbelief, thinking at the time no way I just heard that. The voice was what I would describe as demonic for lack of better words. At least Tom Waits with a deep pitch voice changer. I try to shake it off and no more than two to three seconds later, the initial hey is followed by another hey this time more loud and seemingly more aggressive. I'm frozen now, thinking possibly a home invader is trying to mess with me or something. I'm looking at the windows after the first hay as well, so I thought maybe they were crouching below the windows. As petrified as I was, I was still in disbelief. After the third and final hay, I told my brother immediately there was someone outside of our house. He sweeps the windows with his bat in hand, nothing. Not a trace of somebody walking through our bushes, nothing. Since then, I've had minimal paranormal experiences. I wonder if hearing or seeing an apparition is worse, because from my experience, hearing those three haze was enough for me to never forget how terrifying these experiences can be. I was an 11 year old skinny kid, prude and self-conscious. One summer day at my family cottage, I went to bed in my jimmies with about half a ton of bed sheets on. That night, I remember thinking the mattress wasn't comfortable at all and woke up to a half sleep state a few times to change position. At one point, I felt the bed was ridiculously hard and it woke me up for good. I noticed I couldn't see the nightlight that was always on. Then I realized I wasn't even in my room. I was laying totally naked on my back, outside on a big flat rock, like some sort of offering to some god. I was so scared I froze stiff, couldn't move nor utter a word. I wanted to scream, but nothing came out, which got me even more scared. As I got used to the darkness, I saw I was less than a hundred feet or so from the cottage. I closed my eyes, concentrated, and when I opened them again, I was able to move. I quickly got up and walked, couldn't quite run, to the house. I remember the cold dirt under my feet, but I had no feeling of the temperature outside at all. I tried opening the door, but it was locked. My mum always locked the door at nights when my dad was away. I had to go around, but the back door was also locked. Fortunately, the window was opened and it was about two feet up the deck. I got back in, slipped in my bed and prayed nothing had followed me through the night. I woke up later than my brothers and sisters the next day. They hadn't noticed I was naked in bed. I would have never heard the end of it. Couldn't find my jimmies, so I got into my jeans and grabbed a t-shirt to join them for breakfast. Later that morning, my older brother, who was playing outside, called my mom to come and check out something. We all ran to see what that was about. He pointed high up. As I looked, I immediately recognized my pajamas hooked to the highest branches of an old, very tall tree. They all looked back at me, 
asking what the hell? And I didn't have a clue. Everybody denied having anything to do with it. To this day, I'm at a total loss to explain what happened that night. I'm an 18 year old male. I live in Chatham, Illinois, just to help create a map of where certain things may reside, for those interested. I see myself as quite a logical person, more so than most. Though sometimes when my mental health is suffering, I become more prone to being willing to accept illogical beliefs, though these periods are typically very short lasting. These experiences listed below happened years ago, and I've had plenty of time to think about them logically. I'll try to keep them concise. This was a few years ago, Chatham, Illinois, spring. My house was largely surrounded by woods, but there were larger areas where there was grass that we mowed as well. There was a long grass area from our house all the way down to a lake. Each side of this grass patch was covered by woods, one side more than the other. At this time, I would typically walk to the lake, alone, every day around 8 to 11 a.m. I would just look at things, do miscellaneous things, hang out. One day, after being at the lake, I started walking back up to my house. Then I heard someone or th something ruffling the leaves on the area to the side of me, in the woods line. I looked ov over only for a second, and I saw something big and black. They were tall and had thicker limbs. I didn't look long enough to get any smaller details. Possibly it was a Bigfoot, possibly it was a Dogman, or possibly it, they, were a person in a costume suit or in weird clothing. Those aren't typical clothes for this time of year. No one should have been at this location. It's private property. All of my close neighbors are above 50. The closest is much older. Right as we saw each other, it, they started running. Not necessarily away from me and deeper into the woods patch, but they started running along the woods line. I then quickly bolted back to my house, told my dad's friend that was staying there, and went back out with my phone whilst recording a video because I figured no one would believe me. I didn't catch them on video, nor did I see them again, despite going out again multiple times. Even alone, late at night, with no phone. They may have been silently watching me at the lake for some time. I, for sure, saw something out of the ordinary. I'm just not sure what. This was many years ago. I was at my grandparents' house, Mechanicsburg, Illinois. They're Christian and go to church every Sunday. They have many little things all over the house. Artworks, artifacts and whatnot. One day, me and my little brother were staying over at their house. I was staying in the guest bedroom. My little brother was staying on the living room couch. So after everyone had been asleep, including me, for hours, I woke up in the middle of the night to crying sounds coming from the living room. I went out there feeling a bit off and saw my little brother was crying. I asked him why, and he said he saw, he said something. I don't remember his exact terminology. Was running up and down the basement stairs. This caused me to be more frightened. I stood there for a minute, then out of the corner of my eye, just looking barely enough to see some of it, I think I see something in the dark kitchen, and it moves over to the basement door. If something was there, I only saw part of it. A long skinny black slash ash colored arm. That was the part of the thing I may have seen. It freaked me out and at that time I cried in fear. I eventually went back to the guest bedroom, locked the door and prepared to defend myself in case I needed to. I eventually fell asleep. The next day I asked my brother about it. He said he was just messing with me. Weirdly though, Everyone was asleep, not just me. So I don't understand how his crying could have been to solely target me. But possibly, though I figure unlikely, he meant solely about the stairs comment he made. Also, when I asked him why he was crying, he immediately said something was running up and down the stairs. That's a pretty bizarre thing to immediately come up with, especially when under emotional distress. So I figured him messing with me was unlikely. If I actually saw something, 
I have no idea what it was. There is little place for something to hide in that house. Maybe if it did exist, and if possession is a thing. It possessed some object and came out of it, and got a kick out of messing with people, but it didn't want to be caught messing with people. My grandma, who lives at that house, has many, many paranormal stories, but we all think she's a bit nutty. I don't know for sure what actually happened in this experience. I think my older brother has told me about some of his experiences at my grandparents' house as well. Chatham, Illinois. I've had many experiences of hearing my name being called, but I think most people have, and it may just be the brain making it up. Outside, at night, in empty places, I've heard a baby crying. I've heard people yelling help and other similar things. Also, in the day, from a storm drain pipe that drained into a stream, I've heard some things. I've heard stories of beings that call out your name or call out for help, though this could have just been a hallucination, or a mishearing or something else, or an actual sound from something, but it was just a normal person doing a normal activity. Divinan, Illinois. I was a young child, two-story house. One day, me and my older brother heard people walking all around and talking upstairs on the second story. We were downstairs in the first story. No one was upstairs. Everyone was downstairs sleeping except for me and my older brother. We were awake. This could have been a hearing of ghosts. I've heard of many similar things happening. The house belongs to a church. It was right next to a church. Though it could have been a two-party hallucination or something outside that sounded like it was coming from upstairs. I've heard talks about that house having black mold, but who knows? I figure this was a genuine experience. I've seen many weird shadows and things out of the corner of my eyes, but I think everyone does, and the human brain naturally does this, and it's nothing paranormal, at least the majority of the time, maybe all of the time. Uncle's wedding spot. I touched some black powder that was in a bowl at church. I felt a weird jolt through my body. I'm not sure what that powder was for. Ash Wednesday? Or why it made me feel like that. Streaks of light in the sky, spots of light. Explainable as space phenomena, aircraft, satellites. Though who knows? Memory of being in a room as a very, very young child. An aluminium or aluminium coloured room. There's a thought in the memory of it being an alien craft. Possibly, after seeing the room, I turned around and saw an alien. This was very likely just a memory of a movie I saw or something that's happened before. Old watching of movies and similar things may sometimes get mixed up into my personal experience memories. Especially as when I watch movies, I invest myself in them so much and live every experience the main character lives in my mind. I recreate their pain emotions, everything. I think more so than the average person does. I've had weird dreams. Aliens, powers, interdimensional travel, etc. Separate dreams, all different. Most likely nothing quite paranormal, just some very odd dreams. I honestly feel like I have more experiences, very big ones, but I just can't quite remember them. I can feel them there, I just can't quite grasp what they are. I do suffer from DPDR, or a long-term general dissociation, which means my memory is shot at the moment. Maybe I'll rewrite this if my condition ever goes away. In my backyard, my dad has a woodworking shed, the size of a small barn or big shed, about 30 to 50 yards from the house. My dog hates the shed. He cries to get out of it because he hates it so much, so you have to pick him up and put him in it, but close the door really fast. Also, he's a lap dog, very tiny. Also, when you walk into the shed, it's a big rectangle with the long sides perpendicular to the door. There are windows on the left and right side of it, but not on the wall where the door is and the back wall. Plus, there's a huge workbench in the center of the workshop. Okay, so this happened between November 28th and December 4th, 2020. I can't remember the exact day though. One night my sister, we'll call her Susan, went into my dad's workshop at about 8pm. Pitch blackout 
and far from the house with all of the house lights off because our parents were asleep except us two. She was painting a cooler for her boyfriend at the time, but needed it finished by tomorrow because she was leaving early to return to college. Since it was her last night and I wouldn't be able to see her for two weeks, I decided to go in there but not help. When I got in the shed, I was surprised thinking, wow it's cold, and how the heck did she get dog's name in here? Well about an hour after I had our dog on my lap, we were sitting very close to the back wall with a two three gap between us, listening to Mr. Ballin on YouTube. Hindsight 2020, that definitely didn't help. I get this super strong whiff of freshly lit cigarettes, which wasn't too odd. My dad's a smoker, so growing up with him I've learned and know the difference in the smells between old and fresh cigarettes. But I thought I should mention it to Susan because it was really strong. Yo, Susan, I just got a super, super strong smell of freshly lit cigarettes. What the heck? Who cares? Dad smokes in here all the time, what's your point? Okay, chill, I was just saying. Thought I should mention it because it's weird. Not even 15 minutes later, my dog is still sitting on my lap. Sits up and then starts aggressively growling and barking at the windows. Keep in mind that it's pitch black out and you can't see out the windows because the shed lights reflect off the windows, making them like a mirror. Then my dog hops off my lap and starts to run around the shed, continuing to aggressively bark and growl at all the windows. Susan and I are terrified because he's never an aggressive dog. Also, if we would tell him to stop barking, he would instantly stop. But as we were yelling at him to shut up, he just wouldn't. Finally, he stopped running around the shed, looks in between us, like in the perfect middle of us, and starts whimper whining defensively, but growling too at the wall that has no windows. Susan, what the heck? What the heck? What the heck? Stop it now. I'm not leaving now. I'm too scared. Me, silently crapping myself and visibly scared. No, nothing is going on. Let's just go inside, Susan. I promise nothing is going to happen to us. Before we go inside, we gather all of her painting stuff and cooler. I grab a super long screwdriver, then hype myself up in my head to open the door. 30 seconds before I opened the door, a super cold airflow entered the room, and I knew it was a sign of a ghost, which made me want to get inside now. So now my 21-year-old sister makes her 16-year-old brother protect her, act like the older sibling and go first. Later found out she thought either her or me. I turned off the lights, which caused my bad anxiety to go to the worst anxiety I've ever had built up and getting ready to explode. In the blackest of black darkness, with my eyes not adjusted, thinking I'm going to die, I slowly opened the door with it creaking unbelievably loud. I had the screwdriver held like Cod's knife commando grip, and looking so slowly around the door, with Susan holding on to me, literally shaking, and my dog, who's ready to run to the house. I thought I saw something, so told Susan to book it. We closed the door and ran into the house, turning on all the kitchen lights. We get inside and Susan says, Oh my god, where's the dog? Now I'm afraid that my dog's dead and screamed, Oh crap, probably outside. We called his name, with the door cracked open for about five minutes, but he wouldn't come. So not wanting to, but wanting my dog to be safe, I convinced Susan to come with me to check the shed. She wanted me to go on my own. Unwillingly, she came with me to go look. I was still gripping the screwdriver like a knife because I could feel something out there. We get up to the shed doors and open it. My dog is there with his tail down, not wanting to leave it. He hates it in there and won't leave, meaning whatever was there followed us. I picked him up and ran back into the house. When we got back inside, we realized that all of the lights that we turned on were now off. We couldn't have turned them off because of how scared we were and our parents had fallen asleep. I locked the door and sprinted upstairs. This was from 8 to around 10 or 11 p.m. More things happened that night, but I didn't experience it because it was in my sister's room. I have more experience if you guys want to hear them, let me know. Also, I bleeped the words to make them more friendly. 
Plus, this is probably obvious, but I'm 17 and my sister is 22 now. It's my second experience. My best friend and I lived 10 years in a village. When I was 15, my family moved to a small town near the village. It was okay because you had to walk only 45 minutes. Between these two places, there was a forest. Every time one of us had to walk there in the night, we called each other. It was a short but creepy street with a large dog, forest animals, and sometimes drunk people. And we felt safe while walking. One day, it was deep in the night. He called me again, but it was different. He sounded scared, and I heard some kind of laughing in the background. I asked him what that was, but he didn't want to talk about it. He only asked me to tell him something so he didn't have to think about it. As he walked, the laughing didn't get silent. It's only a five minute walk in the forest, but it had to be less loud. Till today, we have no idea what that was. Some people say it could be a bird or some other animal. I know some animals around are very strange at night. I live in Germany, so there's no mountain lion thing or tropical bird. The laughing had a sound like someone mixed a witch and a psychopath. Some details could be a little different. It's been like eight years. Never heard something like that again. I went to the Birdcage Theatre in Tombstone earlier that day, then returned to my hotel over a silver mine. Around 2am, I awoke to a flashing light. The front door is lateral to my bed, and its window has a curtain over it. The tiny space between the curtain and the window sheds light right into my eyes. Then, there was an urgent, quick, yet muted knock on the door. Around eight to ten knocks in very quick succession. Then the door handle started to turn back and forth aggressively. Luckily, it was locked. And I thought it was an intruder with malintent or someone who was lost looking for the other apartments on site. Then, I heard the sound of an old clock's second hand start ticking away in the corner of the room next to the door. I remembered there was no clock there, which I confirmed in the morning. The second hand continued for about an hour. I got out of bed during this time and peeked out the windows. There were no lights outside, no sign of cars, no footsteps circling. It was extremely cold, even though the heater was on pretty high. I got out of bed pretty quickly after the intruder heard me grab a weapon to defend myself. There were no other sounds, like footsteps or anything, except the clock continued. I was sure it was a human, but everything about this seemed too weird. Like I couldn't replicate the knock sound on the door or the walls, and the handle turning only sounded the same when I tried it from outside. There were security cameras, but I haven't heard back yet as to whether someone approached the door seeking entry. The weirdest part for me was the sound of the clock, because that is the only thing I cannot explain if it were a real person. There's a lot of superstitions where I'm from. One of the famous ones that many believe in the Philippines is that when someone dies, a moth visits and they say it contains the spirit of the dead or an ancestor. Years ago, my wife's grandpa was not looking well anymore and they worried he might die anytime soon due to his sickness. He spent his final waking moments at home, laying in his bed and having his family say their goodbyes. A few hours after everybody did so, he passed away peacefully. My wife's aunt broke the news to everybody in the house, and just as they all gathered in his room while waiting for the morticians to come, there was a big moth that had entered the room, without anyone noticing, and it remained there throughout the night. Some say that it's their grandpa, as the belief goes, but another weird thing happened right after he passed. As if in unison, the dogs in the neighborhood started howling for several minutes. 
as if the moth wasn't creepy enough. The next day, just when neighbours started to learn that my wife's grandpa passed away the night before, a neighbour and friend of the family came to them and asked when the grandpa passed away. And when he learned it was the night before, he couldn't believe it. He told them that last night, he saw their grandpa walk out of the house with a little girl holding hands with him, although he never saw the little girl's face or where they were going. Oddly enough, when my wife's grandpa fell ill some time ago, he told me a little girl visited him and kept telling him to come with her, but he never would. Not sure if that was the same little girl that the neighbour saw, but it was eerily coincidental. I don't really know what category my experience would fall under. But earlier this year in summer, I had a really strange experience when I went out fishing that I've never really been able to shake off. It started off normal. It was a warm, windy day with an overcast. I was making my way to a fishing spot that was just out of town. This place was an open beach that is located at the mouth of a river. It's quite the hot spot during summer, so there are always at least a handful of people fishing in the area. But when I arrived, the beach car park was completely empty. This really didn't raise much concern because at the time I went on a Tuesday and assumed most people would be at work. However, I've fished on other weekdays and there's always been at the very least one or two people fishing. Anyways, I continue on as normal and cast my fishing line. Around 45 minutes go by and nothing happens. The sounds of seagulls and albatross permeate my surroundings. And then I get this growing feeling inside me that something was wrong. It felt like I was somewhere where I shouldn't be. The best way I can really explain the feeling is like the same you get inside of an empty mall or walking down a really long hallway or as if you just trespassed somewhere, if that makes sense. This is where it gets really weird because the wind then suddenly drops along with the sounds of the wildlife like a switch. All I heard was the sound of the waves, but something wasn't quite right with that either. It was like the same wave sounds were playing over and over again. The best way I can explain it is as if a small piece of time had been sectioned off and it was being played in a loop. At that point, I was really startled when I noticed this and the same feeling at the start was growing more and more. It hadn't even been a whole hour and a half I was there and I decided that I shouldn't stay there any longer and noped out of there. Now I don't know if I would consider that as a paranormal experience per se, as you could argue that everything that happened was just a string of coincidences, which is possible, but I just can't get over the abrupt halt of the ambient wind and sounds that to me was the really strange unnerving part about the whole experience. As a disclosure, I'm skeptical of ghosts now as a grown adult, but I've recently started becoming more interested in the supernatural again. And I remember experiencing things in St. Augustine as a child that still make me feel a little uneasy to this day. My friends insisted they'd truly seen spirits for themselves with their own two eyes. But perhaps the oddest part of all was that even professional adults working at this school as teachers public safety officers, dormitory supervisors, etc. also said they'd had experiences on the campus, like seeing doors slamming out of nowhere. In general, we were never told by the adults that ghosts aren't real, ever. Instead, we were told that there was no reason to be afraid and not to let such stories or sightings bother us. My first year at the school, I lived in a dormitory for girls in grades six, seven and eight which was supposed to be very haunted. I occasionally felt as if someone was watching me when no one was around, and often felt cold currents of air at random during hot, sweaty months, during the dead of night in a room with no air conditioning. The latter was probably just external airflow, making its way inside via cracks or gaps in the walls. 
but my roommate and I were still terrified at the time. I still remember that more than once, I'd end up not sleeping at all and relating my fears at breakfast the next morning with the staff working the night shifts. I was told to never go to the bathroom on the first floor during the night. This wasn't an issue because I only lived on the second floor, but there was a famous sighting of a ghost of a person with a broken neck and my friends claimed that they'd seen the apparition as well. Once, during an unrehearsed fire drill one evening, a few girls told the dorm supervisors they'd just spotted someone in one of the windows and they were too terrified to go back inside. I know they weren't deliberately trying to find an excuse to not go back indoors because some of them had only towels on from being caught in the shower when the fire drill first started. When the supervisors did a head count, no one was missing. Despite this, the supervisors looked worried, even as they told everyone to go back inside. There were constantly strange smells around the school that we couldn't place and rumours of deaths on campus, such as a blind girl who died from horrific burns in the shower long ago, or a woman who was murdered by her mother. Some of these stories were even told by the adults who worked on the campus. So, truthfully, while I may be sceptical now, I've had enough experiences and heard or seen enough from others to still feel that there's a window of possibility for there being more to reality than can be understood on a mortal level. I think if I hadn't ever lived in a place like St. Augustine, I'd be a lot more closed off to the possibility of such. And if I had lived there longer, I only attended school there for a total of three years, perhaps I'd have eventually seen something that would have made me be a believer for good. So for background, we live, rent, in an older house from the 1930s and we moved in October 2020. My husband was deployed until the end of November 2020, so he wasn't there at first. It's two stories with one bedroom, living, dining, kitchen and bathroom upstairs and a finished basement with a bedroom, bathroom and storage room. Our daughter sleeps upstairs and we sleep in the finished basements. I'm a huge skeptic and I don't quite believe in ghosts, but I definitely believe in demons because of my religion. For this reason, I'm pretty freaked out by the paranormal. When I moved, my mom and dad helped me move in. They lived pretty far, so they stayed a few weeks. My one day, my mom asked me why I was pacing the house all night. I told her I heard it too, and it must have been the pipes creaking. This is a regular occurrence in our house, and it really freaks my mom out, but I attribute it to wood floors and old pipes. My mom comes to visit in May, and we take a trip to see some family. While I'm gone, my husband tells me how terrifying it is to be there, alone with the footsteps. While he's downstairs, he hears pounding on the door. He grabs a gun and runs out, but there's no one there. I'm under 30 seconds. It's almost impossible to get out of sight of our door, between the busy road and two large parking lots. Strange, but he dismissed it. We got a ring camera. A month later, there's pounding at our door again. A month later, there's pounding at our door again. Our blink camera registers absolutely nothing. Or maybe the Wi-Fi wasn't doing well since my husband was gaming. We figured maybe it was the back door and we mistook it for the side door. This was pretty hard to explain away, honestly. A few months go by with nothing. Then, while my husband is out hanging out with some friends, I decide to get in the shower. The shower is directly under the dining room. I hear the chairs scraping across the floor and assume our robot vacuum has started and maybe my husband put it on a schedule. So I check our indoor camera and find the robot sitting in the living room. I go check and see two chairs have been moved. Thankfully, my husband is almost home and he calms me down. He tells me the chairs might have been out of place before my shower and maybe the sound was air in the pipes. No big deal. This is an old house after all. 
Then earlier, I was sitting in our recliner with my daughter, who has a crow. She's passed out in my lap. It's a heated, vibrant recliner, so it's on and it's not exactly quiet. My husband went to Walmart to get some popsicles and shower steamers, so it's just me, the baby and the dog. I see what I think is my husband creeping through the dining room and I hear him messing with something on the table and maybe with the door. Then my husband texts me, I'm checking out at Walmart now. So I'm panicking, but I don't want to wake my daughter. I still can't hear it moving around. I think maybe it's a mouse, but I know that's ridiculous. My dog lifts his head up and looks into the dining room. He perks his ears and stares for about 30 seconds and then put his head down. I felt better knowing he was aware and not afraid. My husband gets home and confirms there's no one in the house. Earlier that day, my husband and I got into an argument and I took my rings off, bad I know, and told him if he isn't okay with just one kid, he needs to marry someone else. We're struggling to conceive and it's been really hard on me knowing he's desperate for another kid and I'm okay if it never happens. I hadn't put my rings back on and they were still on the dining room table by the door, right where the rings were. We have two and a half weeks left until we can move. It can't come fast enough. I'm afraid to be alone here. My sister and I were just talking on the phone about some strange things that had happened to us all throughout our time in our childhood home. I mentioned that I thought our home was haunted because our mother had taken a rock from Auschwitz and brought it back home. My working theory is that the rock itself carries energies or memories or spirits that are imprinted into the stone because of the horrific trauma within the walls of the concentration camp. My sister and I were sharing stories and experiences we had had that correlated with the time the rock had been in our family home, as well as correlated to the movement of the rock from room to room. I'm very aware that what my mom did was disrespectful and disturbed some energies. It's just taken a long time to put two and two together about our experiences and this object. I'm thinking of contacting a rabbi from a local synagogue to ask what the best way to go about this is. But if any of you have any ideas or information that could maybe help us out in our search, we'd really appreciate it. Just for reference, things we would experience in our house were physical pain unrelated to any obvious injury, mental health struggles and thoughts of ending our own lives, unexplained and unintelligible whispering or shouting, loud bangs with no discernible cause, strange sounds coming from underneath the floor in my bedroom, odd lights and anomalies in my sister's bedroom, and an atmosphere of constant unease or anxiety. Any ideas you all have would be greatly appreciated. We don't know how to go about this, but we definitely want to talk to our mom about having something done to cleanse the house and doing something with the rock that honors the spirits of the innocent dead while banishing any evil spirits connected to it. When I was about five or six years old, my mother, father, grandmother and I went to this restaurant out in a semi-remote location. It has since been turned into a factory area, but at this time it was a log cabin type restaurant back off the road in the woods. My father is a big talker. He'll pretty much have a really long conversation with anyone if they get to talking. He was closing up a conversation with this guy whom he went to high school he hadn't seen in a long time. My mother, grandmother and I went outside to head onto the vehicle. I was getting a little tired because it was late, so my grandmother picked me up. She was holding me like a bear hug and I had my head on her shoulder and behind the restaurants illuminated by a telephone pole slash street light, I saw a very tall figure. It was probably seven to eight feet tall, completely covered in blonde hair. Sort of like Cousin It from Adam's family, but with more noticeable features. I said, Grammy, there's a monster. 
She turned around and saw it too. She started running towards the car. About this time, my mother saw it too. It didn't come towards us. It just turned and stared at us. We were all freaking out and then my dad came out of the building. He started running too because we were terrified. He didn't see it though, because once he came around, it took off into the woods, or at least out of eyesight. I know Bigfoot seems like a hard pill to swallow, but I saw something that night. I know I was a child, but we all saw it. My mom and I talked about it for the first time in years today because we drove past the place the restaurant used to be. And she described it exactly how I remember it. Since around 2014, I think, my brain doesn't process time well. I've had periodic experiences with something that I've been to calling the bathroom ghost. A vast number of these experiences have happened in or around the bathroom of places I lived or stayed at for some odd reason. The first encounter in what I think was 2014, I was at a friend's house where I often spent the night. I was in my sophomore or junior year of high school at the time. I always got a lot of strange feelings in that house. The air felt heavy and wrong in a way that I couldn't quite explain or articulate. And certain rooms I just couldn't be in because they would make me feel anxious for some reason. Anyway, one of these days I was staying over, I heard something strange that scared me half to death while I was in the bathroom. To the left of me was the door, to the right was the bathtub. On my right side, I heard a voice whisper, hey, clear as day, not far from my ear. It made me jump out of my skin and I recognized that it sounded exactly like my friend's voice. Now the speed with which I convinced myself it must have somehow just been the shower curtains shifting was honestly remarkable. But just as soon as I'd calmed myself down, it did it again. Hey, in that whispered tone, in my friend's voice. Needless to say, I got out of that room as fast as possible. Now I want to clarify that there was no way this could have actually been my friend. Reasons being that A, the voice came from the side of the room opposite the door, and there was no nearby room through which he could have spoken through the wall or something. Also, the voice wasn't muffled in any way. B, I could clearly hear my friend talking loudly to his mom in the living room, which was at least 30 feet from the bathroom door. Now I only experienced this once in that house, but here's why I think that whatever this thing was, it's followed me. In my first apartment with my friends, there was one notable circumstance of something happening in the bathroom. Now, this may not have been the same thing. It wasn't a voice which mimicked one of my friends. This was at least three to four years after the first experience. But myself and my two roommates were all sitting in the living room watching movies when we suddenly heard an odd sound from the bathroom. The hairdryer had turned itself on. It had been plugged in, so maybe it was just a spooky coincidence. But there hadn't been any sort of power surge to have triggered it, and we were all pretty spooked. There were a couple of other interesting brief experiences in that apartment, but those are even less potentially related, I think. So maybe those can be shared some other time. The most recent experience which truly makes me believe that this thing has followed me happened just last year. Not too long after moving into my current apartment. Once again, I was in the bathroom and I heard a voice come from the door. Clear as day, I heard my fiance's voice say, hello? Reasonably, I had assumed that they had came to the door to talk to me, which we do with some frequency. So I responded back, hello? I didn't get any further response, so I started to get a bit nervous. My fiancé had been in the bed when I went to the bathroom, and the bedroom is just next door. But we have long since learned that we can't hear each other if one of us yells from the bed towards the bathroom. Hence why we sometimes stand outside the door to talk. I got out and, a bit nervous, asked if they had been trying to speak to me through the door. They were lying down where I left them, 
when I came into the room and they very casually told me that no, they hadn't. Fully shaken now, I told them what I heard and they were a little amused like, ah, the bathroom ghost strikes again, which I did also find funny. They weren't making fun of me for being a little freaked out by any means. My fiancé is not the type of person who tries to scare other people by messing with them, so I know they weren't just playing a joke on me and acting like they had no idea what I meant. I'm an ICU nurse in France. The ICU ward is made of a long corridor providing access to four units of five rooms. One night shift, we talked about ghosts with co-workers, and I stated that they do not exist at all. Around one hour later, a patient begins to spit blood as usual, so I go with my co-worker to suck the blood out of his mouth with the suction unit. After five minutes of suction, the unit stopped the suction. I thought a blood clot was blocking the system. I followed the line to see the clot and nothing to see except that the device is turned off. It's a key we have to put on or off. I tried to rationalize the event, but it's not an electrical device, so dysfunction is impossible. Strange feeling. My coworker told me that I should keep my mouth shut because someone has something to say to me. Later in the same night, two patients separated by two rooms told us they saw a woman in pink. We all wear white uniforms. No visitors are allowed after 10 p.m. and it was 3 a.m. Goosebumps. No more unsettling event for the rest of the night. The following day, nearly 3 a.m. in one room, a light constantly lit up by itself. Every time we turn the light off, it lights up when we exit the room. We could stay in the room. The light remains off, but as soon as we leave this room, the light turns on. After five light on, off, on, I turned off the light and said, enough, I've had it. And the light remains off. Three days later, near 3 a.m. again, we heard a huge crack on the unit door and the doors began to shake. We looked at each other and new crack, new shaking. We trek through the windows and we can see no one. The corridor's lights remains off, motion sensor. Some weird shit happened later involving the death of a patient, but I can't say more for obvious purposes. This happened to me a few years ago, and it wasn't until today that I realized I may have been in some sort of danger. My husband and I were camping with two friends in a pretty remote area, deep in the mountains, on the shore of a small lake. Our first morning there, I decided to paddleboard to the other side of the lake. One thing about me, I have submechanophobia, which is fear of submerged objects in water. It doesn't affect me too badly. I love the water, but I get the heebie-jeebies when I see sunken boats, large fallen trees, massive boulders in the water, stuff like that. It's worse when I'm alone. I do pretty okay when other people are with me, and it has to be a large, clear body of water. Swimming pools, rivers, or lakes where the water isn't super clear don't bother me. So I go off by myself on my board. The lake is one big oval, so you can basically see everything from the shoreline. However, where we had set up camp, you couldn't see the whole lake, so I quickly lost sight of my husband. I started to freak out a little bit because I had immediately seen a big sunken tree. This is a high Sierra lake, so the water is crystal clear, but quickly turns black because of how deep it is. I told myself I was being silly and needed to get over my dumb phobia. I didn't really see anything else, but I decided to stay close to shore because usually that makes me feel better. But this lake doesn't really have a typical shore. It's all granite rock that just quickly and steeply drops into the water. I still don't really see much in the water, but I'm really starting to panic, which is weird. I have this overwhelming feeling to go back as fast as I can, but I think I'm just being dumb. I try to deep breathe because I really want to get to the other side where there is a waterfall. 
so I trudge on trying to calm myself and enjoy nature, yet still feeling like I should go back. As I'm paddling, I start to realise how alone I am. I keep looking around hoping to see a hiker, but I'm completely by myself. I try not to think about that because I'm almost to the waterfall and the view is gorgeous. As I get closer, I see there is an island for lack of a better word. Just a large amount of granite that is fairly close to shore. There's a single plastic chair sitting on the island, which is funny, but slightly unsettling because it's such a weird thing to see so deep in nature. I'm still freaked, so I figured if I got off my board and onto the island, I would feel better because I would be on land and my phobia wouldn't bother me. I pull up my board and I start walking around, trying to enjoy the view, but I just can't. I feel terrified. The waterfall is so much louder now that I'm near it and I realise if I were to scream, no one would hear me. My husband is the only person around for miles and he can't see or hear me and I'm terrified. I keep looking around because I feel like I'm being watched. I decided I can't take this. Even if it's just my stupid irrational fear, I have to get back as fast as I can. I get on my board and paddle down the centre of the lake rather than keep to the shore because it's quicker that way. It takes everything in me to do it. I can't shake the feeling I'm being watched and I feel so damn vulnerable in the centre of this deep blue lake. I'm shaking the whole way back, but as I'm getting closer to camp, relief sweeps through me. I get off the board and go see my husband. He happily asks me how it was and I can't talk. He asks me if I'm okay and I just start crying. I tell him I think my stupid phobia made me panic even though I didn't really see anything in the water. I feel totally insane and I'm just happy our friends aren't back from their hike to see me behaving so irrationally. We left later that day. Since then, I've become more open to the unknown. I was thinking about it and it suddenly hit me that maybe something was going on and it wasn't just my phobia, especially because I never even really saw anything that triggered it. I'm not sure if I just freaked because I was alone, the phobia, or something else. I guess I'll never know, but I'm curious if others have been in a similar situation or have any insight. This occurred in the middle of September in 2014, when I was 10 years old, just the beginning of fifth grade. The layout of where this happened. You would walk across the streets, take like a minute or two to walk into their driveway, go down the hill and then take a right and about 10 feet from the back of the house was the trampoline. Looking out from the trampoline with the house behind you, to the right was a white picket fence with houses to the right of that and on the left was dense trees that slanted into the middle of the property about 200 yards. When I was a kid, I would go to my neighbor's house to go jump on their trampoline in the backyard. I jumped on it so much that I didn't have to ask anymore because I was there four times a week, every week, for two years. One Saturday night with my friend and I, we'll call him Jay, decided to go jump on the trampoline at about 5.30 p.m. We crossed the streets, walked across the road, went back to their hilly backyard, and then got on it. Jay and I were jumping and doing tricks for a little bit, having fun, but felt uneasy and uncomfortable the whole time. Something just felt off. At about 5.45ish or 6pm, the sun was just starting to set. The sun was tapping the horizon, looking actually very pretty, but we were in the shadows of the house. Jay was having fun, but then mid-jump, froze, face white as a ghost. He slowly and shakily pointed his finger towards the dense trees and said scaredly, What the hell is that? I'm already crapping myself but slowly turned around. In the distance, about 150 yards away, in the shade of the trees was this probably around 9 foot super skinny bony thing that was white with a grey tinge to it. 
Its head was oval shaped like a football, had foot long finger claws, six to seven inch fangs in its mouth, and bright white piercing eyes. It was half hidden behind a tree with its hand around it, just staring at us angrily. Jay and I just stared at it horrified and in disbelief for probably 10 seconds, but it felt like 10 minutes. It was like we were in a trance and couldn't move either out of fear or because of it. The thing looked like it was going to run at us. I could just feel it. I told Jay that we had to leave now or we would die. With all of my strength, I forced my little 10 year old body to move and Jay was ahead of me. We jumped off of the trampoline and started running, but Jay tripped and I wasn't gonna stop. As I was sprinting up the hill, I looked over my shoulder to see if Jay got up and I swear this thing was coming. So I ran even faster than I have ever run before back to my house. Jay entering right after me, scared to death. We never went back there. I lived there for another two years and never talked about it again. I told my parents about it, but they didn't believe me, which is understandable because who's gonna believe their 10 year old about something like that? I haven't told anyone this story except my girlfriend because I literally blocked it out of my head, even when all the haunting stuff happened, until I was reading Reddit and remembered it a day or two ago. Ever since that day when I'm alone in the dark, not at home, I get this overwhelming feeling of being watched. Also, it kind of looks like Slenderman and a Skinwalker combined. Mr. Ballin on YouTube has a thumbnail that kind of looks like it, so if you look up the most believable alien encounter, the Skinwalker Ranch story on YouTube, and look at his thumbnail, imagine that and Slenderman combined. I've been living with my fiance and his parents for a year now. Although if I'm honest, I think this has happened before, but I cannot remember for sure. The thing about me is my memory is shocking. I have flashes of things, but if it happened more than a week ago, then I cannot be sure if I've remembered it correctly. I'll try my best though, and I hope it makes sense. Anyway, on with my story. On one of my mornings off, my partner went off to work and as I wanted a lion, I put in some ear plugs. It can get noisy when the others get up and I went back to sleep. On this day, they all went out early, leaving me home alone, but at the time, I wasn't aware of this. The window was open as I get really hot at night. I was in the dream sleep, whatever that is called, but all of a sudden, I'm woken by someone or something screaming my name right in my ear. At first I thought I was still dreaming, but I say screaming is that what it ended as? It repeated my name two or three times, getting louder each time. After the third time, I was genuinely scared awake, and although I would not open my eyes, I got the sense of someone standing over me breathing. I thought I could feel that anyway. When I eventually opened my eyes, there was no one there. I thought maybe my partner's brother, who also lives in the house, was playing a trick on me, as he knows I watch the ghost hunting programs and things, but when looking around the house, I was alone. I looked out the window, as that is where everyone goes to smoke in the back garden, but there was no one there and all the cars were gone. To this day, I'm not sure who was trying to wake me, but I know there was no one there. I know I was not dreaming as it woke me, and although I did not open my eyes, I was awake fully by the last time it called my name, which is what scared me the most. If anyone has any ideas on what this could mean or be, I'd appreciate it. I've not had any bad or good news, so I don't think it was a message from someone warning me of something to come. It was also a long time ago now, so not expecting anything either. I do believe the house to be haunted, as I have heard footsteps walking in the hallway when I'm in the bathroom and on my own. But as I've not seen or heard anything else, I don't think much of it. Okay, this happened back in September and I finally got the nerve and enough clarity and reflection on it to start writing this post about a month ago. 
I keep writing and deleting and rewriting because the events itself was so difficult to put into words, but also because there are also so many other facets and surrounding events that seem to be involved. It shook me to the core in a way that very few events in my life have, and I honestly kept shaking too much to type for the first few attempts. Also, I keep getting really frustrated that my words are coming off like a fucking creepy paster. No offense to anyone who wants to write one. I just feel like the more I say, no, really, this happened, the less it sounds like reality and more like fiction. Which, ironically, writing the previous sentence probably skews things towards fiction as well. I don't know. Feel free to call it whatever you want. But I'm posting this because I honestly and truly could use some advice or shared experience or suggestions on reading material that could help me figure out what the hell happened to me and what I saw. I'm also not too familiar with this group, but it seemed to be the most appropriate. If there's another one that might fit better for serious inquiry into the paranormal or unknown, please let me know. Thank you for reading this far. I have a horrible ability to ramble in an attempt to provide enough detail. It's my firm belief through literal decades of self-run tests that there is, in fact, another realm of existence beyond the physical and that I, along with many others, have the ability to access those realms. When I was younger, I didn't think there was anything beyond and I just had bad wiring in a broken brain. But I went out to prove that, and I couldn't. There was too much evidence to indicate that yes, I was ill, but there was also so much beyond ordinary reality that we don't normally perceive. I'm only going into this much detail to make a point that, in my honest opinion, there's mental illness and a spirit realm. And whenever I have an experience that seems supernatural, it's first and foremost treated as a delusion, until proven otherwise. So back in September, I saw a creature. It looked like a Wendigo, but nothing seemed evil or emaciated about it, which was confusing. Also, in the past year, three close friends have seen something similar within the local region, if not the same creature. They never told me any of this, but when I told them of my experience, they went white as a sheet and then told me what happened to them. But their experience was opposite of mine, in terms of the intent and impression of the creature, which is also confusing. Also, this was not a physical being. I want to be very clear about that. I was drawn into the astral plane or spirit realm, like the energetic framework that provides the support and structure for every object and living creature that is in ordinary reality. In my opinion, it's like the energy plane is the lumber that builds the underlying structure for a house. The wooden framing is always there supporting and forming the house that we see, and we know it's there, and it's really responsible for the structure that we see, but we never see the framing. Doesn't mean it's not there. You'd get called crazy for denying a home has unseen framing, but mention the same idea with another level of reality? Definitely nuts. Anyway, here's the experience. I was at work, and a strange sensation took hold of me. I felt my attention drawn towards the shed outside, and as I turned to look, I was pulled from my body into the astral realm. It wasn't a slip that I initiated, it was more like I was wearing a full body safety harness, and a cable suddenly pulled me from my body with tons of force. It was as if I was launched from my physical body. I've got decades of experience with astral travel, but none where I'm the one who wasn't initiating it. I didn't have time to worry or even think about what just happened, as the being, whom I believed initiated the entire experience, became apparent. I think he pulled me out there to evaluate me or inspect me, or maybe it was just the same type of curiosity a human would have towards finding a dune bug or grasshopper, because the power imbalance felt about that great, like a bug looking up at a human. Anyways, I had somehow passed through the wall and was now roughly 15 feet outside the house, and the being was walking between me and the shed. 
He walked toward me and then turned and walked away to my left. While walking, he slowed, turned and looked at me. The strange thing is, I was mostly in awe reality. But looking towards him, it was as though the power within, within him tore a fucking hole through reality. It was like I was looking through a living porthole torn through the fabric of reality. A waving, undulating portal through the physical world and into the ethereal framework that holds up the illusion of matter and everyday reality. This portal through the veil was circular and ringed like liquid with fire without heat, and he seemed to generate the fuel with his flesh. Like his skin was radiating and sweating energy so powerful, it tore a hole through reality. He too was cloaked in a cloud of orange and blue fire, but unlike ordinary fire, like fire and electricity had somehow created a wet, pulsing offspring through some forbidden union. He was massive, between eight and ten feet tall, extremely muscular, and of human form until the lower legs, which were much more similar to a deer or moose. The human portion of his body was, well, ripped, <laughs> but like, as muscular as possible while still maintaining ultimate dexterity and speed. Not some puffed up gym rat that's lost the ability to tie his shoes or scratch his back from bulk, but a perfect balance of strength, speed, fluid flexibility, and a terrifying grace of movement. I'm making this point because seeing his form and movement for a brief moment made it clear he was God of the hunt, a dealer of death and a master of destruction. And yet, he never seemed evil or malicious or dark. It wasn't a sense of ugly doom and hatred he exuded, but pure beauty. I know, believe me when I say it was extremely confusing to see that juxtaposition. Words seem pitiful tools to describe the experience, like trying to do brain surgery with a sledgehammer, but I'm trying here. But his head was the skull of a moose, maybe a deer or a horse. Pretty sure through research it was a moose, which we have here but the antlers were more like a hybrid of an elk and maybe an Irish elk, absolutely massive. A much oversized skull with a simply physically impossible rack. The especially otherworldly part of his antlers wasn't their size though. It was that they started at the skull looking like ordinary, albeit way oversized antlers, but they transformed into the same energy slash fire slash electricity that he was engulfed in and flowed out like lightning into the corona surrounding him that formed the tear in the veil. Like they were helping generate and maintain the portal between our realms of that sacred and the profane. By the way, I'm in Wendigo country. The tribes from this area of the Algonquin speaking origin. Oh yeah, forgot to mention that. I'm right where that tale originates. More on that later. This moment is what still has me so shook up even months later. He seemed mildly interested and slightly amused that I was looking at him, that I didn't look away in terror at the power that was before me. I'm really not trying to boast. It was more shock that I kept looking up than bravery. However, I will say that through studies regarding shamanism and dealing with spirits in general, I've never forgotten that it's a crucial fact you can't go into those situations and forget that you have to hold your ground. Even if you feel like an ant facing a steamroller, you stand strong and tall if you want to get us alive and sane. Never forget your power. The stronger the being, the stronger you have to stand. The best I can do to explain the experience is this. I felt sobbing with joy that whatever this thing was that was studying me had chosen to not obliterate me, to turn me to dust and ash with a single thought. I felt confused but eternally grateful that there was something in my being that made him look at me with mild curiosity, that whatever was within me and had granted me grace instead of annihilation. Again, it was like being a bug, lost inside the house of someone who chooses to catch you with a cup and throw you outside, instead of crushing you and throwing you in the trash. He turned and walked away, the portal closed. I was thrown back into my body, 
and suddenly I was back inside and helping my coworker install hardwood flooring. Yeah. So here's the thing. He looked like a Wendigo in the sense he was a man's form mostly, with a skull for a head with antlers, and the legs slash feet were moosage. Earlier I described them in that more detail, but honestly, the whole thing lasted 10 seconds tops, and studying his feet wasn't top priority. Pretty sure they faded into hooves though. Full disclosure, a lot to take in, huh? But here's the rub. He was not emaciated. He was not malicious in any way. Opposite of that, in fact. And I felt blessed to be in his presence, not terrified for my life. Also, he wasn't a physical creature, but an ethereal one. So, what the fuck? Please, if anybody has any experiences or ideas or references, I'd really appreciate it, because I'm at a loss. Also, I didn't go looking for this guy for the record. In fact, I had been thinking a little before they happened that it seems most stories of Wendigo are wildly inaccurate, and that it has recently become the new hit monster for Hollywood and the internet alike. And when actual folklore on it seems pretty different than from how it's being represented. Not to mention this variety of tribes with a variety of versions. Then this fucking happens. <laughs> Regarding my three friends, they've all seen a creature that more closely resembles the popular rendition of the Wii Wendigo, and it was most definitely malicious. One of my friends is convinced it's after him, and honestly, I wouldn't be surprised. One friend's first thing he said to me when I described what I saw, I'm so sorry my dude, that thing has ruined my life. Nothing has been the same since I first saw it. And I should add, I don't think I've ever seen him scared like that. Former Marine who served in Afghanistan, who's also having a shit time recently and is passively suicidal and struggling with addictions. Yeah, and he got scared. I should mention there's been a lot of death in our area in the past two years, although not caused by whatever these creatures are. Car attacks, but mostly ODs. I've lost two brothers since 2020 and other friends. My marine buddy lost seven friends. Four of them in the main group. Just him left. I'm so fucking sick of all the death and suffering and isolation and fear lately. It makes me wonder if these creatures are attached to it. I don't know, just a thought. Here's that note on my mental health. Just putting it all out there before someone suggests it was all psychosis. And hey, who knows? Maybe I'm extremely skeptical in nature. I think it's healthy. But I really, really doubt it, and here's why. Long story short, I started hallucinating slash psychotic systems since I can remember. Been seeing shrinks and whatnot for my whole life. Diagnosed bipolar, PTSD, that shit didn't help the psychosis. Had to go through a dozen meds to get balanced, been to grippy sock jail, rehab, etc. So am I crazy? Sure, that's a word for it. But here's the thing. I've hallucinated for six months non-stop. I know what that's like. And there's always a giveaway with the hallucination. You just have to use logic and hunt for it. Also, the chronic and extreme hallucinations were when I wasn't on medication. And often when I was strung out from trying to make it stop with heavy drug use. Which works great for a few hours, and then it's worse, so you do more. Then it's better and, huh, oh yeah, that's called addiction. When this experience happened, I was stable. I haven't had psychotic symptoms without due cause, like extreme emotional distress, chronic insomnia, etc. And even then, they're mild. Traces, halos, etc. Think tiny amounts of psychedelics. I'm putting out this info that can be used to discount my story because this story sounds obviously kind of insane. The fact wasn't lost on me, huh? And I'll be the first to doubt my sanity. Having blind faith that I'm fine with my history is a recipe for disaster. So I'm including all my past history and diagnoses in an effort towards full transparency, but also to reach out to anyone who might be going through similar struggles with, am I crazy or is this spiritual? My desire to determine the existence of anything beyond the ordinary led me down some amazing paths. Shamanism, Wicca, entheogens, psychedelics, yoga, Buddhism, etc. And was the driving force behind my minor in religious studies for my BA. 
I decided when I was younger that I would have faith in nothing until I could prove it. And I would assume that there was nothing in the beyond until I could. No God, soul, etc. Nothing without evidence, derived through logic and obtained facts. I was in trying to prove to myself that there was nothing beyond what science provided, and that I was indeed just crazy, that I proved something more. So, so much more. I didn't go out seeking God. I wanted reassurance that I was just broken and that no one had a soul so that I could kill myself without guilt or fear of hell. So a few nights ago, she told me she was just in her room relaxing on her phone. She said at one point she heard my voice behind her very clearly say her name. Not a whisper, but very clear and direct. She said she could easily tell that it was my voice, but that was something about it was off. Something she couldn't point out, but she said something just felt different about it when she heard it. At the time, I was asleep in the living room. That was just the first experience. One day passed and nothing happened. The next day, it was my turn. I stayed up early into the morning on the phone with my girlfriend. The last message I sent was at 1.22 in the morning. So she went to sleep and I was sitting on the couch for a few minutes just listening to music. I walk to the bathroom to pee and I hear her. Her room is across from the bathroom and the hallway is kind of narrow. Through both of the doors, I hear her giggling and laughing. I thought she was watching something on her phone that she found funny and it sounded exactly like her laugh. There's a small crack in her door, so I just kind of glance as I walk past. I didn't stop walking, but saw the light of her phone as I passed by. The next morning, I woke up and she was on the couch, parallel to the one I slept on. After I woke up, I started talking to her and making conversation out of last night. I heard your goofy ass laughing last night, I said. She asked me when, to which I responded around 1.30 in the morning. She had gone to sleep at around 9 last night and hadn't woken up until well into the day. By this point, we were both thoroughly confused at these experiences. What creeps me out the most is that it was almost the same with her experience. Something about her laugh just seemed off, and the laughing I heard went on for a good 5 minutes or so. And she's a deep sleeper, so talking or laughing in her sleep is not a viable explanation. And if it were, it wouldn't explain what she heard two nights before, since we were in completely different rooms. I never believed in Ouija boards, until I was in college. My freshman year, my roommate bought one and we all decided to play with it as a hoax. We planned this whole thing out and we scared him real bad. Next time we used it, we decided to actually try it and see if it would work. And it did. Too well. We lived in West Philly next to a cemetery and on land that used to be a mental asylum for indentured servants and slaves, as well as a farm where a lot of slaves died before abolition. Not to mention all the people who died to violence in West Philly over the years. We got a lot of interesting people at first. A doctor who died from typhoid fever a slave who was whipped to death, a young man who shot in the 80s. We even able to find some of their graves in the cemetery exactly where they told us they'd be. It was like uncovering a key to the past, but then things started to get really bad. We got a child who refused to give us their name or tell us anything about their past. Instead, it kept asking us questions and when we didn't answer, it would start to spell the answers out for us. Things that none of us would know about each other or what we never talked about. Stuff like childhood nicknames and foreign languages. Stuff like embarrassing moments. We would play for hours so we had a lot of time to spell out whole paragraphs. And then it uncovered one of our friends, who wasn't even playing, secret. Some childhood trauma that she hadn't told anyone about. She started sobbing and immediately stormed out. We tried to say goodbye to the spirit but it wouldn't let us. It was vehemently pushing the eye away from the goodbye. We finally hung up, for lack of a better word, 
and chucked on our friend who then told us the story. We were all dumbfounded. She never played again, but we were hooked. Unfortunately for us, every time we used it after that, we would get the same spirit. Eventually, we uncovered his name, Yubel, and he told us that he wasn't technically a real kid. He died during the pregnancy and killed his mother along with him. She never named him, so we picked his own name. He said we were his first and only friends and that he loved us and would find a way to be with us. We immediately were freaked out and put the board away for good since we were convinced Yubel was a demon. Only, it wasn't for good. The board would magically appear around our dorm. It would be open and have the eyes set to yes. We would hear some strange noises at night. Footsteps, croaking, rattling. Whenever we talked about anything in the room with the Ouija board, strange things would happen. My roommate had set up these glow-in-the-dark decals in his room. Our other friend said she liked them and that she wanted some. The same one who vowed never to play after it uncovered her secret. That night, she went to bed, and when she turned off the light, her ceiling was covered with glowing symbols. She called us over and we all saw it, but when we tried to take photos of it, it wouldn't show up on the camera. After we turned the lights back on, they had disappeared and never came back. We had enough, so we decided to play one last time and tell him to stop and leave us alone. He got angry and started saying a string of random numbers and letters. We googled them, convinced it meant something, and the only thing that came up was a radio station. We tuned in on our phone, and it was a religious radio channel, and the host said all the sinners who were listening would face eternal damnation. We were terrified, and then the eye rapidly started spelling out see you soon, three, two, one, goodbye. And as it did that, my friend's stuffed rabbit croaked as if it were a dead creature, and flew off the shelf. We ripped him open to see if there was a voice box inside or something to explain it, and there was nothing. We threw the board into the closet and never touched it again for the next two years. Two years later, I came across it again, realizing it must have accidentally ended up in my stuff after we moved out. And I decided to play with it to see what would happen this time, thinking that last time it was all an elaborate hoax my roommate had cooked up to get back at us for scaring him the first time. This time, it was me and a whole new group of friends and I. As soon as we asked the first question, it starts spelling out Yubel. I never let it finish. I immediately moved it to goodbye and told my friends we were done. I've tried the board several times since then and every time I get Yubel, no matter who I'm with, people who have never even heard the original story, I'm done with these for life. Ever since playing with it the first time, I've attracted spirits like wildfire. No one can really know for sure if the rumors about death cycles are true, but I'm almost entirely convinced that they are based on this very brief emotional experience. About two years ago, I was still in college I was walking home from dropping my girlfriend off at the train station and I saw a very peculiar couple. Both the woman, Caucasian, and the man, African-American, were dressed in full 50s or 60s attire. I couldn't quite make out what they were saying to each other, but the fractions I caught of their accents were stereotypical of old 60s noir films. At the time, I disregarded it, thinking it was just some theatre couple walking after a show still in character. Then in hindsight came the first sign something was up. They started kissing passionately, but people were walking by them as if they weren't even there, straight up walking toward them or around them mere inches apart, leaving no room for comfort from two people who were making out directly beside them. From personal experience, people either divert their gaze from couples engaging in PDA or stare at them and they definitely give them space. I realized I was staring, so I looked away and passed them. As I was crossing, I heard a loud swear. Someone shouting, get away from her, n-word. Shortly after I heard a gunshot, screaming, and a car veering as if it were crashing. Terrified, I sprinted across the street and looked behind me, 
expecting to see the worst. Instead, there was nothing, just the regular crowd of people walking by. No car wreck, no murder scene, no couple, absolutely nothing. My heart was pounding and people were staring at me as if I was a freak. I knew I wasn't crazy since I had many experiences with the paranormal in this, one of the oldest cities in America. Especially since the part of campus, my apartment was, in, was located next to a very old cemetery and built on the site of several former mental asylums. I tried tracking down information about murders on my college campus and I came across a website that tracked police records of violent crimes with a database dating back to the early 1900s. Sure enough, there were several racially motivated hate crimes on that very street in the 50s. There was not much information other than the type of crime. The entry simply said murder or included a sentence detailing it such as racially motivated or hate crime. Very few had some names associated with them. Unfortunately, I couldn't narrow it down anymore. This happened last year. I started dating a girl and on a date, we decided to go for a walk in this gorgeous cemetery next to my house. As we were walking, I felt a tap on my waist. It sent tingles throughout my body and assuming it was her, I told her to stop because I didn't like it. She had no idea what I was talking about. Moments later, I felt it again on my right hand. We were holding hands, my left in her right. I knew this wasn't her because there's no way she could have reached around my back to tap my right hand with her left. It was then that I got this super strong feeling of being watched. Now, my girlfriend is super scared of spirits because she's extremely susceptible to them too. So I didn't tell her anything, but I could feel cold sweat beading on the back of my neck. I made an excuse and we left. On our way out, I continuously felt the taps until they finally stopped near the entrance to the cemetery. I thought that was over with, but when we got back to my apartment, my girlfriend asked me if I heard humming. I had been so caught up in my thoughts, I didn't realize that I heard a little girl humming a ring around the rosy. As soon as I tuned in though, it stopped. I told her I thought I heard something, but we just played it off on the fact that my building was super old and the walls were super thin. Until my girlfriend left that night, we both kept getting the feeling we were being watched. I walked her to the train station and the feeling stopped. After her train arrived, I started walking back home and I started getting a slew of weird thoughts. Random children's songs, random words. And then I felt like I was shaving thoughts but instead of in my own voice, I heard them in a muffled little girl's voice. Worlds like, why don't you play with me? You're so boring. You wasted my day. Stuff like that. I was absolutely terrified when they were coupled with the sensation of something continuously touching my hand or pulling on it as if a little kid was trying to get my attention. I ignored her as best I could, but the craziest thing happened when I crossed an old train track. She started screaming in my head, stop, don't go there. I can't go with you. It's too far from home. I didn't stop. I crossed over and then the voice of the little girl started crying and she yelled out, fine, I'll tell mother on you. Immediately, everything stopped. My mind cleared up. The feeling of being watched stopped. I went back home and fell asleep with no problem. The next day, I was doing some work when I started getting the feeling of being watched again. I was petrified. Not long after, I could feel breathing on my skin. It was a horrific feeling. I didn't know what to do, so I started texting my friend who had a ton of experience with spirits. She told me not to pay attention to it in case it was a demon and not to type anything that it could see for itself. So I called her. I didn't tell her anything about the humming, just that I think I picked up a malicious spirit. Not five minutes into the call, she looks at me and goes, are you having rings around the rosy? It was then I knew I wasn't insane. 
I even later did a genetic test for schizophrenia, which came back clear. I switched to my phone and typed to her that the little girl was singing. Then she sent me some prayers to say and some Wiccan spells if those didn't work. But soon after, the little girl just vanished again after another hissy fit that I wasn't playing with her. She was furious and screamed at me that she was going to get her mother. That night, I had a very vivid dream about the little girl. She lived in the late 1800s to early 1900s. I saw her as a child being abused by her mother for not being pretty enough or smart enough. I saw her go to a school for mentally challenged kids, but they were all strapped into what seemed like torture devices. Then I saw her being lobotomized and finally murdered by her mother. At the very end, she told me her name, Charlotte. She was eight. The next morning, I went back to the cemetery, determined to see if I could find her tombstone. Sure enough, where I first started feeling the touches on my date, there was the tombstone that said, in loving memory of our special daughter, C. And the rest of the name was weathered by age. The date had said 1882 to 1890, exactly eight years. I was freaked out and went home immediately. No more appearances that day. That night, however, I was yanked from my bed. I looked around but couldn't see anything, but I had an overwhelming feeling of pure evil and dread. I saw images flashing before my eyes of Charlotte's mom whipping her and abusing her for not being normal and not being a lady. I felt an icy cold grip on my neck and my throat felt like it was being crushed. After a momentary paralysis, I turned on the lights, pulled out my phone, and started reciting the prayers my friend sent me. I heard screaming in my head, but that felt deafening, as if she was in pain, but eventually it all disappeared. I never heard from Charlotte or her mom again. Two months later, however, my landlord was fixing a pipe in the kitchen. We would often talk about stuff when he was doing maintenance. So I asked him about the property across the street that they owned but was completely abandoned. He said it used to be a school for mentally deranged children, basically psychopaths, and that they were found in the basement was full of torture devices and gurneys. They would strap children in to give them lobotomies. He even showed me pictures of these things. The house was abandoned because museums wouldn't take the items. And the city wouldn't help them get rid of them claiming that they were protected under some bullshit monument or artifact law. A little more research done by myself and I found out the buildings around me used to be mini farms with tons of slaves belonging to the upper echelons of society and that my apartment was a brothel and then a hotel and then a mansion to some wealthy man and his wife who had a daughter before being turned into apartments. Oh and the streetcar tracks that Charlotte wouldn't cross? That building used to be a church and that ground was holy. I never felt more validated that I wasn't insane in my life. I'm hesitant to leave my room at night, besides for the bathroom, because if I'm the only one awake, I tend to hear voices from downstairs. We've got a big creaky house, so I'm sure it's usually my brain turning normal settling noises into conversations. I can handle the ones I'm not involved in, and I think I know the hallucinations by indicators like me knowing very specific details about who the voices belong to. I just don't like it when they say my name. I've heard both sing-songy calls from down there and harsh whispers from maybe the third stair up to the hallway. Again. I used to accept these as brain fucky quirks, until other people started hearing it. My younger brother is 16 and really loves scaring the shit out of himself. When he claims to hear things, I don't really pay it any mind because he had the same shit childhood as mine, and I wouldn't be surprised if he got similar issues. We've even heard things at the same time, including heavy boots on our stairs, a woman crying in my parents' bedroom while no one was home, and a man's cough from his bedroom while we were eating dinner alone downstairs. We responded to all of these by tactically checking the house with kitchen knives 
and then locking ourselves in our bedrooms. Recently, my mom told us about waking up to a growl beside her bed, which I've experienced myself, but again, wrote off as a hallucination. And she told us in secret that my extremely skeptical stepfather recently heard someone whisper his name twice from under the bed. Of course, because both of them were asleep, it could be extremely mild sleep paralysis. It just weirds me out that both of them admit to something they've made fun of me for taking a boat before. A few hallmarks of weird shit that's gone down recently. My mom and brother were sitting at the counter when the top of a coffee jar popped into the air and landed directly beside it. I heard them both shriek as I was walking up the stairs when it happened. My skeptical girlfriend slept over and said she woke up around 3am to the sound of children running in the hallway. My bedroom door was open, even though I closed and locked it, and neither of us recalled getting up. I have two younger siblings, three and five, but obviously neither would be awake and they can't leave their shared nursery without my parents unlocking the door. She jokes about my haunted house, but claims not to believe in ghosts. Parents went away to stay at a resort for a few days, picked up my brother from work at 11 after my own nine hour shift, and my dog was closed in the laundry room where he sleeps. There was blood and diarrhea all over the floor. So we rushed him to a 24 hour vet. Turns out he got so nervous being locked in there, he bursted blood vessels in his colon and let rip the red tides. Weird part is, he's a really chill young guy and hasn't done anything like that before. There's also only a four inch space between the wide open door and the laundry machine. He'd have to nudge it closed somehow, which doesn't make sense and isn't something he's ever done in his five years. My fear was that someone had been in our house and closed him in there. Again, he's a really chill guy and from experience, he'd go anywhere anybody led him. We live on an acre of land in a little farming community and a lot of neighbours visit him and hop the fence to bring him treats and toys. I kind of brushed this off as a weird incident and my brother and I were starving and decided to eat outside before cleaning up the blood shit. On the porch, we talked about how our dog could have closed himself in there. Both of us couldn't come up with anything that was, wasn't scary as hell. Like 10 minutes into choking down some burgers and we both jump up. The light in the living room, which we could see from our seats, turned off. This essentially confirmed my theory that someone had closed the dog in there and they were still in our house. I get ready to call the cops, but my brother runs to the garage and stupidly turns on the light, which can be seen from fucking everywhere because it's separate for the house. He comes running back with a mini hacksaw and a goddamn mallet. I'm pretty good at shutting off my emotions for survival. So I took the hacksaw and was just kind of resigned to death or killing someone. I'm really scared of cops, so calling them just didn't seem worth it anymore and went around the back of the house. From the back, all of the windows to everything are visible. We scanned the dark living room, the kitchen and the front room and saw nothing. Then my brother goes, oh fuck. Through their balcony door window, we can see that my parents' bedroom door is wide open into a dark hallway. Fucked up thing is, we'd gone up to change before we ate and the door was most definitely closed and I'd left the light on. Again, I should have called the cops at this point but I was so numb to all reason and we went inside. For some reason, my brother started yelling and slamming all the doors he checked, which was surprisingly intimidating. I didn't chime in because he's got a deep voice and I have an extremely feminine and light one, which wouldn't do much work. We checked every room, every bed, closet, bathroom. The last thing we checked was the nursery closet and I swear to God, I thought someone was going to jump out. But there was nothing. Nobody was in there. Unless they somehow managed to escape unnoticed in the 30 seconds it took us to run inside. We slept on the couches that night. Again, my brother and I were home alone. I'm not religious, but I like Catholic imagery. So I have a lot of prayer candles. It's pretty common for my Jesus and Sante Nino de Atocho ones to inexplicably fall off my desk. I've only been in the room when it happened once. I was doing my makeup and right behind me in the mirror, both just slid off and hit the ground. 
They're sturdy enough not to break. It's just a weird recurring thing. My mom saw someone walk into my brother's room and from the corner of her eye, I apparently was at work. But she claimed she didn't remember that my brother was at work as well until he called her later to pick him up. We have a weird Harry Potter style closet under the stairs. It's really creepy, painted with a thin coat of streaky gold paint and it has the names and ages of three kids that lived in the house before us painted on the door. They were allegedly a really creepy religious family of like six kids and five adults all crammed in here. Reportedly got in trouble with neighbour parents for playing Ouija, lol. It's happened before, but it's become relatively frequent that the last person will turn off all the lights and walk upstairs, only to see that the light in the closet is on. Last month, my mum woke up to get a glass of water, and as she was walking up the stairs, she heard the door creak open and the light switch click on. She's not white, so she had the good sense to just keep walking rather than investigate. I work at a popular chain restaurant that does delivery service. I work long hours and I like my job. Delivering at night is a little spooky sometimes, but otherwise, I have no complaints about what I do. Tonight, I had an order in the back of a pretty dark neighborhood that doesn't have street lights and the neighbors are acres between each other, so it's pretty spacious. I park my car at the guest's house and make the roughly 200 foot walk up the driveway. Porch lights are on, I leave the food on the porch as instructed. As I turn to start walking back, I heard what sounded like a large dog bark, but it's loud and it sounds like it's in front of me, next to the window at the front of the house. The guest walked outside right then and said thank you. She was very polite. I said, thank you. By the way, do you have a dog? She replied, no, but my neighbor has a chihuahua. She's a tiny thing. I said, thank you once again and was on my way. I was about to get into my car when I heard a whisper coming from in front of me. It sounded like it was only a few feet in front of my car, but it was low and deep. It said, come here, come here. And that's when chills went down my body and I booked it out of there, no hesitation. I was nearly in tears, mainly from confusion. What could have possibly happened tonight? Am I losing it? I do believe in ghosts and spirits and such, but what was the meaning of that? I'm sitting in the parking lot of my job as I write this. I'm confused and a bit spooked for sure. Any help would be appreciated, or at least some direction on what this might mean. Some weird stuff has been happening in my dorm tonight, and apparently, I'm not the only one experiencing this. I've had people on my dorm floor tell me they've had some strange stuff happen to them later into the night or early morning, around 1 to 3 a.m. For context, I was unable to sleep as I woke up late and lived in a dorm built in 1939, the oldest standing dorm my university still has around. I live on the third floor, the top floor of my dorm, and tonight I wanted to be productive and get some laundry done while I can, since the laundry room here is always in use. I went out of my room and immediately began feeling like someone was watching me from behind me. I ignored it since I looked over my shoulder and didn't see anything out of the ordinary. I make it down to the room and the ground floor where the lobby is, and the feeling is still there as I'm starting to walk towards the steps of the basement. I look over my shoulder and behind the structural pillar in the lobby is a black figure that I could make out a shoulder and an arm moving back around the corner as if something was hiding. I looked around the lobby and no one was there. I became very freaked out by this and checked the basement and no one is active in there. Everything is silent. On the bright side, the laundry room was free to use, but too freaked out to go back down there. Other things that will happen to me is I'll see shadows of feet underneath my door and hear footsteps like someone walking down the hall at night. Sometimes I look through the peephole in my door to see if there's someone out there, 
and it has a big field of view, but sometimes there will not be anyone there. The doors in my dorm are extremely heavy, and it's very loud when opening or closing them, and I would know if someone comes in or out of a room. Finally, the floor has a few unisex bathrooms, and I typically will use the one right next to my room. Sometimes, I'll be up late and open the door all of the way and turn the lights out. Mind you, there are several bathrooms all over the floor, and this one isn't the most popular. The light will just turn on randomly, and the door position never moves. Normally, people leave it barely cracked or halfway open, and I'm the only one that I know of who opens it completely when finished. This likely can be easily explained, but it still freaks me out. For some context, I was visiting my grandmother on my mum's side for the weekend. My aunts and uncles are usually there as well, and we always do that on the weekend to check up on her and see how she's doing. Now for the entire day, I had the feeling I was being watched or followed, but for the sake of not creeping anyone out, I just shrugged it off as paranoia. Around late afternoon, I went to wash my hair and was there for quite some time. Now, my mother didn't know that, so she was calling me from in the kitchen. Usually I'd be able to hear her, but after 10 minutes in there, it sounded as if the entire house had gone quiet, so I couldn't hear her at all. And my sister told her where I was, but she replied, no, I just saw her in here. She was playing with the cats. She just passed me. When she told my sister that, she came by the daughter of the bathroom and told me what our mother had just said in a very confused voice. I was also confused because I'd only seen one of the cats all day and couldn't find the other one for feeding time, so I assumed he was in one of the rooms ignoring me because he did that a lot. Now that way before I went to wash my hair, so around morning, going into the afternoon. After that, I hurried to finish up and went to the kitchen where my mother was. She looked up at me and said, why are you changed? You were just with the cats a few minutes ago. I shook my head and told her I'd been in the shower washing my hair, so I couldn't have been with the cats when she saw me. She simply shrugged and told me that she must have mistaken someone else for me. But as she said that, I felt a feeling of dread in the room. Now I'm not sure if she truly was mistaken or if she really saw something, but I know my aunt had gotten mistaken last week, thinking I was out in the garden with the cats when I was with my grandmother at the time. I don't know if I'm just paranoid and taking this too seriously, but I'm mostly worried for the cats because they were with me both times. Do you think the cats might be in danger if this entity is really pretending to be me? Can it pose a threat to my grandmother as well? And if yes to either question, what do I do? So I've had encounters pretty much all my life. It started when my grandmother on my father's side passed away a year before I was born. Eventually, after I was born, the house we lived in started to be filled with the scent of her perfume. Our dog would go nuts at shadows on the walls. And at night, the mobile above my crib would randomly go off. It even continued until a speaking book on the floor opened up and started to play. Eventually, my family queued in and told her to leave, and all was thought to be good. When we moved to our new house, I developed a fear of going up the stairs by myself, due to the shadow person. My family for years believed it was always fear of the day, as I had always said the shadow person lived on the top of the stairs. We'll flash back to two years ago now, and when with a medium, she asked me about the stairs and what is wrong with them. I responded, I saw something there, and she said, oh, that's just your grandmother watching you. That quickly became commonplace as I started to see my grandmother's spirits in my room for sometimes weeks on end. It would even sit by the foot of my bed, and sometimes I could feel her walking behind me. That was another thing the medium told me about, was her spirit, was aware when I knew she was around. But recently, things sort of shifted. One night, 
I woke up to a dark shadow thing standing on the end of my bed. When I told my family, my brother chimed in. Oh, you see that too? Sometimes it comes to my room and watches. He showed us where it watches from and it was a straight beeline to where it appeared in my room. It freaked out my family as it wasn't anybody we could have known and nobody had died recently. So we now stay on the lookout for the creature dubbed Bob. A little over a decade ago, I experienced the scariest event that's ever happened to me. I was, at the time, living with my mother. Her home was one of the oldest houses in the city she lives in, which is known as the oldest town in Texas. The house has quite a bit of history. It's known in our family as being haunted. When you walk through the house, you can feel it in the hardwood floors and the walls creak from the weight pushing down on the floors. When you were alone in the house and this happened, you knew that someone was walking through the house. You would go to greet whoever was coming, but often there was nobody there. I only say this to give you the sight that something is or was up with that house. Moving on, the night of this experience. I was up at 1am playing Red Dead Redemption online. While sitting in the gaming chair, I suddenly got an odd feeling. As mentioned above, the house gives you these odd feelings at different times, so I just try to ignore it. All of a sudden, while playing, the hearing in my right ear goes out. It literally felt as if someone cupped my ear, and then the loudest ear ringing I've ever had started. I wish that I could adequately describe how intense the ringing was. Immediately, my body hair starts standing up and I get an intense feeling that I can only describe as my brain telling me I'm about to be attacked by a predator. In my head, I'm literally telling myself, dude, you're tripping, stop being a wimp. You know how to fight. Why are you afraid because of your ears ringing? And things along that same thought pattern. The ringing finally subsides after about 30 seconds or so. I stay seated and continue gaming on Red Dead Redemption. I'm thinking about how odd it was for about one minute before it happens. Whoosh, the hearing in my left other ear goes muffled immediately the ringing starts blaring. Once again, the hair on my body stands straight up. I can feel the tiny hairs on my body pushing against my clothing and I once again get the feeling that I'm in danger. I'm telling myself things like don't be a wimp, stop being a bitch, yes again, and so on. I'm telling myself this while at the same time my gut is telling me I need to get away. My inner dialogue would be hilarious to listen to if the situation was different. It would be a mix of dude you're tough, why are you tripping? My gut at the same time is telling me leave now, go, something isn't right. Well of course, my brave manly dialogue wins and I push through until the ringing stops and the muffled cupping of my ear clears up. All is clear on the home front, right? Of course not. I'm not even gaming anymore after the second event. I'm staring at the TV thinking about what just happened. I'm literally thinking about what kind of medical conditions would cause that type of reaction in one ear and then the other. I'd guess another minute or so passed and then whoosh. Both of my ears feel as though they're cupped and the sound, atmosphere or something is snatched away from my senses. Of course the ringing, the ringing that I cannot begin to adequately describe. I promise you that there was not one single hair on my body that wasn't standing straight up. I feel that they were standing up so straight that they were pushing new hairs through my skin. Every millimeter on my skin was goosebumps and hairs trying to vacate my body. There was no inner dialogue telling me how brave or tough I was. My gut was screaming at me, run, run, run now, run now. I cannot describe the terror that was in my body. I felt like a child about to be devoured by a lion. I stood up and turned around on quick walk to the bedroom. It honestly took every bit of my manly ways to not break off into a dead sprint through the house. I climbed into bed next to my wife who was asleep. She rolled over and touched my arm and woke up. Baby, what's wrong? The goosebumps on my body were so irregular 
that it brought my wife out of her sleep. I know how they felt to me, but if anything, I'm understanding how intense the sensations were. I don't remember what I told my wife, but I'd imagine it was me downplaying what had happened so that it didn't scare her. I'm sorry for the anticlimactic ending. I didn't say anything. I didn't hear anything chasing me. When I got to the room, no furniture moved or anything spookier than what had already happened. I've had some strange experiences before in my life, but I can tell you that nothing that I've ever experienced has caused my body and mind to go into primal fear mode. I had always thought that I knew what primal anger, primal fear, or primal emotions are. Up until that point, I didn't. About a year and a half ago, I was sleeping in bed with my wife. I'm having a strange dream about a shadow figure chasing me saying, you need to let us in, you need to let us in. This voice is calling to me in a child's voice. I'm running from this thing and it's getting closer. You need to let us in. It gets to the point that this shadow is about five or so feet away in the middle of saying, you need to let us in. And my wife elbows me and wakes me up saying, baby, did you hear that? I'm just coming out of my sleep and she says, I heard kids talking. I asked her if it was our boys talking. She replies, no, it wasn't the kids. Even while she was telling me that, she heard kids talking. I was already wondering in my mind if I was talking in a kid's voice while I slept. When she said no, it just reaffirmed to me in my head that I was dreaming and talking in a child's high-pitched voice. I played dumb and tell her that I don't know what it is and everything is all right. In my head though, I'm convinced that I'm talking in a child's voice. Really? I just wanted, didn't want to freak her out and tell her that I'm being chased by a shadow saying, you need to let us in, while simultaneously speaking in a high-pitched voice while I'm sleeping. The next day, I go to work and I'm telling people that I worked with what happened. I'm not giving the details of me being chased by a shadow, and I wasn't getting into details about what the shadow was saying. What I was telling them was that I was talking in my sleep and apparently I was talking in a kid's voice because I woke up my wife and she thought kids were talking in our room. I must have told two or three people about me talking in my sleep while making light of the situation. I'm completely certain at this point in time that it was me. Fast forward a year or so to roughly six to eight months ago. At this point in time, we've moved from our house in Colorado to a place in Texas. Once again, I'm asleep and I'm having a near identical dream. A shadow is chasing me saying, you have to say that we can come in. Once again, I'm running from this shadow trying to escape while it's saying that's over and over. This time, the shadow was close. When I say close, I mean within arm's reach. As the shadow is reaching out to grab me and is inches from touching me, a high-pitched child's voice says, come in. As the shadow is inches from grabbing me and the words come in are hitting the second syllable, my wife elbows me, baby. I wake up and the first thought that pops on my head is that I'm talking in a kid's voice again. I wait for her to tell me what she heard, that, that she heard kid's voice again. She asks me, were you just standing over me on my side of the bed? I just saw a shadow, or maybe she said silhouette, staring down at me. I tell her, no baby, I was lying here asleep. Once again, I didn't say what I was dreaming about or detail what happened before. I don't wanna freak her out and say something like, hey, that's crazy. I was just dreaming about a shadow figure while you saw one in the room. Cool, huh? I downplayed the situation while comforting the wife, but in my head, I immediately thought back to the first dream and how it was the exact same dream that happened before. In both dreams, a shadow was chasing me. In both dreams, it was an identical high-pitched child's voice telling me to let us in. And the most scary thing of all is that in both dreams, right at the climax, my wife has woken me up right as the shadow was about to catch me. After this, most recent dream, it makes me wonder if it was actually me speaking in the child's voice the first time. 
I think back on how I made light of the situation and joked about it at work with co-workers. I went a few months without telling my wife about the dreams, but I finally told her. She remembers both instances and it really freaks her out. I've got to be honest that after the second incident, it has caused an immense amount of food for thought on my end. I don't necessarily feel scared from the dream, but the weird factor feels like a 10 out of 10. It began with small things, like frequent wall knocking, footsteps walking around my bedroom, not coming up from my friend's apartment above me. I hear this stuff a lot, so that's not really a concern. Yeah, it's a little creepy, but it doesn't bother me. Not nearly as much as what else I'll list. This one time, I was with my friend sitting in my room, and my mom left 15 minutes prior for an appointment. My friend and I were chilling on the bed, and we heard three loud knocks on my bedroom door. And she asked if it was my mom, and I was like, yeah, and I told her to come in. But she didn't answer, because my mom wasn't actually there. I had gone to open the door in case she didn't hear me, but there was nobody there. Another time, I had another friend over, and I went to get us some water from the kitchen, and I heard her saying something. So I said, one second. I was like, one room over. So I wasn't more than 15 feet away. And I came back and asked her what she had said. And she looked at me and said, I didn't say anything. But it was so clearly her voice. She's not the type to pull pranks. She's a teacher and we're really close. And she knows I get super freaked out. So she wouldn't do anything like that to freak me out. I was on FaceTime with my friend one time. She's from Norway. I had my laptop on the desk facing my bedroom door. I left the room to get something from the kitchen and ended up having a conversation with my parents for four or five minutes. I came back and she said that my door was swinging open and closed. I have this jewellery box from when I was a kid. You know, the ones with the ballerina or fairy and it plays a little, little classical sort of tune. She said she had heard that music while the door was swinging open and closed. I was sufficiently creeped out. I've had other instances where I'll be on FaceTime and one of my friends will hear or see something while I'm in another room or not paying attention. Another time, I was laying on my bed and I felt as if something had slammed onto my bed from underneath. The whole thing shook. Most of the time, it's just knocks and footsteps inside the room I'm in. Things will move around. Pretty basic. Maybe a month or two ago, I was sitting in my mom's bed watching a show. Both my parents were in the kitchen and I saw a tall black shadow figure pass through the hallway into my bedroom. I was so freaked out, but I was sure it wasn't going to harm me. Now one of my friends can see, hear and communicate with spirits, etc. And my ex-girlfriend, who I just recently broke up with, is someone who can sense and feel when there is something present. I was walking with the two of them to the front hallway. And when we passed by the living room, they looked at each other and said, you saw that? They said, yeah, but I didn't see it. They told me it wasn't a harmful spirit, just a man who probably used to live here. Mind you, whenever something happens, my dog notices it too. And her ears perk up and she'll be looking in the direction of the noise or whatever is moving. Now, by far the creepiest thing that's happened to me was a month ago, maybe a little more. I was taking a video of myself for TikTok and I felt my hair get tugged. I didn't think anything of it until I rewatched the video and I saw a lock of my hair get pulled away from my head. I live in a terraced London townhouse where the walls are extremely thin and you can hear every creak throughout your house and in the houses on either side. Over the summer, I was left to house sit my parents' house, and so was home alone for around a month and a bit. Over this time, I'd been spooked a few times by the neighbours walking up their stairs in the middle of the night, and various other creaks and bangs. 
but there is still a distinct difference between the volume of noise from the houses next door and my own house. Not once did I genuinely think something was in my house. On the last night before my parents were due to come back, around 2am on FaceTime to my boyfriend, I heard what sounded like someone walking up my lower flight of stairs. I told my boyfriend to be quiet so I could listen. I noticed it was louder than what I'd usually say was the sound of my neighbour's stairs, but I ignored it. Until... I heard the unmistakable sound of my parents' bathroom door creaking open and slam shut, and the sound of a tap being turned rapidly on and off with the water hitting the sink. In my house, you may be able to hear the neighbours move about, but you can't hear their water running. My boyfriend said he couldn't hear anything, but after seeing the look on my face, he advised me to call the police. I don't spook easily from ghosts or spirits, I just genuinely believed someone was in my house. A week before, a neighbour told me to make sure to lock my back door as there had been a few instances of burglary on the street. I immediately thought that it could be a predator or burglar that had stalked out my house, noticed it was just a small young woman on the property and decided to break in, and that I'd stupidly forgotten to lock the back door or a window or something. The police come within minutes and I'm literally shaking as I open the door, like quivering. They storm the house yelling police and check every single room and possible signs of entry. Coast was clear, no perverts or burglars, and every window and door was locked, meaning no one else was in the house. I was so embarrassed, but thanked them as they left. One male officer asked me as he walked out the door, do you believe in ghosts? I responded that I didn't really, I hadn't even considered the possibility of ghosts at that point. I was fully convinced I was under threat from a human being. The living are a greater threat than the dead, as my grandma always says. I then remembered the tap running on and off in my parents' bedroom. I went to check, and there were a few droplets in the sink, as if the tap had been used recently, but not for a few minutes, meaning none of the police officers would have used it. I fell asleep fine that night, more just annoyed at whatever it was that made me so scared I had to call the police. As a kid, I was moved around a lot. The sixth house was outside of a small town called Beaver Lodge. It was located far back from the road and the driveway was a kilometre long. The tree line behind our house was off limits as it was full of muskeg that in the past had swallowed up cattle and a tractor. We had 10 acres but only had access to two. The house was previously owned by drug dealers so from day one it had an eerie vibe. The first incident happened during the winter. I began having horrible nightmares and waking up in a cold sweat. This happened the rest of the time we lived there The next thing was early in the morning. As I waited for the bus, I heard a very strange squeal and then a loud crash. I bolted back to the house and ended up missing the bus. The third time, myself and my older sister were babysitting our three younger siblings. We had put them to bed around 7.30 and then started watching movies. Around 9pm, I went upstairs to check on the two younger siblings. They were fast asleep. I settled on the couch in the basement with my sister and continued to watch a movie. Then all of a sudden, we heard frantic thumping as if someone was running up the hallway above us. Then one of the doors slammed shut. My sister and I looked at each other and proceeded to head up the stairs. We peered down the hallway, terrified. Our parents' bedroom door swung open and then slammed closed again. We bolted down the stairs and stayed paralysed on the couch until our parents came home. I have more stories from this house. Let me know if you want more. The place is in China, while I was there for a tour. During a visit to a place which is famous for its tea, Longjing tea. The tour guide brought us to a famous well which strangely until today, I've not been able to Google and heard of. The well, 
unlike a usual well, it's only barely surrounded by any wall or stone barricade to stop people from falling in. The guide showed us the well and its strange phenomena. A ripple created on the water would not cease to stop. I'll just keep going. Shortly after playing around with the well, we moved on to an area not far away from the well. But that's where the strangest thing happened. I saw another tour group around the well and one of the guides is standing in the well as though it's a short puddle, which is ankle deep, jumping up and down while beckoning me over to join him. Just as I was stepping into the well, someone grabbed hold of my arm and said, what are you doing? And I was like, I'd like to join them and turned over towards the well with no one in sight. I didn't let my parents know about this, but did tell my mother many years later. Recently, I saw a ghost documentary about a farm in the US, which is haunted. In the story, there's a well hidden below its floor with the same property, a ripple which never stops. This happened when I was in college and I couldn't figure out any explanation. This happened in Portland, Maine, and if any city is haunted, it's there. The whole city was burned down more than once and it just has an eerie feel. My roommate and I were leaving our apartment for a couple hours to go work on a school project at night. We said bye to my cat who was walking around the kitchen and locked the door. We always locked our door because we live in a sketchy area. A couple hours later, we came back. The doors open. Immediately, we're freaked out because we both remember locking it. We slowly step inside and don't see my cat, who always runs to greet us. We hear him meowing and we find him shut in my roommate's bedroom. He was definitely out when we left. The next thing we noticed, the most terrifying part, is our magnetic whiteboard, which was on our fridge, was in the middle of the kitchen on the floor now. Earlier, I had written a list of all my homework on it. So it said drawing, painting, sculpture, etc. And it had some little doodles on it too. But now everything on it was erased except the word pain from painting. I took a pic of it, but I can't find it. Now we're panicking. We first think someone broke in, so we call our guy friends who live down the road and they rush over with knives to search through our apartment. Nobody's there. Nothing is stolen. Stull, Kansas, is notorious for an old church and cemetery said to be haunted. I live 10 minutes max from Stull and drive through it all the time. All of us do. Some people believe the hype. Some have used internet information to debunk it. Doesn't matter to me. I don't know what to believe, but I know what happened this particular night. Friend and I driving, 2 or 3 a.m. Stull is set away, out on some winding roads in the country, and I'm terrible with directions because I never had a car till I was 20. I'm 25 now and getting better. Cruisers like this for me are destinationless because I'm always lost. Car has old locking brakes, I'm pretty sure. So we were driving and a dog or deer ran out in front of my car. I slam on the brakes on the gravel and we skid sideways on the road to a halt. As we do so, the figure floats down the ditch of the road, up the other side and over the fence, disappearing. On the other side of the fence, a large hill on what I assume is the old Stull Cemetery. One not easily found from the main roads. Due to the winding roads and the properties being blocked off with gates here and there, somehow I had managed to skid to a complete stop in the dead of the night, in the middle of nowhere, because a ghost had run across the road. And there she disappeared into the cemetery. And we got the whole ass entire fuck out of there. Believe what you want. I'm 27 and have very, very few freaky experiences like this to recite. But this is the real deal here, folks. I have nothing to gain. I don't know any of y'all. I'm just a corn-fed Kansas boy who shit his pants on a dirt road.
When I was a child, I used to see ghosts in our old apartment in Manila. Mostly were just blurry figures of a person that is just passing by. But one night, while I was late at night watching TV, I saw a man standing on our stairs. The man's wearing all black, and I can clearly see his face. I could even see that he's a skinhead. He doesn't look menacing. He's just looking. But I was so scared that I peed my pants. I told my mom about it, but she wouldn't believe me. My dad at that time was a delivery driver, so I barely saw him. We moved to another town after a few years. Decades later, while we're reminiscing about our life in Manila, I told my family how I used to see ghosts in our old apartment. My dad was shook and told us he used to see ghosts too. He asked me why I didn't say anything. I said I told mom, but she wouldn't believe me. My dad said he used to see a black figure of a man on our stairs whenever he came home from work. My younger brother told us that also that he used to see the same black figure around our house. Then I told them I could see him clearly and describe how he looked. My dad told us the reason why he had to do a blood sacrifice of a chicken ritual. It's because of the ghosts he sees. He thought he was just too tired from work. And then he told us the history of that apartment and who he thinks that ghost is. Few years before we moved to that apartment, there was a tenant who committed suicide by hanging himself on the stairs. He was a nursing student studying for his licensure exam and he rented that apartment alone so he could focus. But due to the pressure from his father, who was a military man and beat him, he decided to end his life. Ironically, I'm now working as a nurse and my brother is in the military. We didn't know his story until this year. About 15 years ago, I was at my best friend's house at night, which had a huge garden and a gate that was the main entrance. We were talking normally, smoking a cigarette, sitting next to the main entrance. This is difficult to explain, and English isn't my first language, so I'll do my best. The gate had a translucent and orange glass window, so you couldn't see who it was if someone knocked on the door. Only their silhouette and the shadow of their feet below the door. At a certain point, we see that someone stopped at the front door, on the street side, outside the house. But the funny thing? We didn't see their silhouette. We only saw the shadow of their feet. We froze, because it was extremely rare, unless it was a child. But what was a child doing in the street at 10pm at night? So my friend went to the gate and crouched down to look under the space under the door. Do you know what happened? The shadow of that person's feet ran out, and we never saw the shadow or the silhouette. At that moment, we were more surprised than scared. So we dropped the topic and moved to the other side of the garden to continue talking. And here begins what I usually do not want to remember. At one point, my friend was silent looking at her cell phone and I just kept smoking my cigarette looking at the wall where my friend was leaning. And that's when I saw it, clearer than day. The shadow of a child, very clear, well-defined, passing as if it had walked in front of us. Guys, it was a kid. The shadow was so clear that I couldn't have imagined something like that. As it happened, it disappeared, where the wall ended. I instantly told my friend, Girl, I just saw something horrible. And she refused to talk about it with me. She said, Don't say anything. Let's go inside. Since that day, I'm convinced that there is something, something beyond our understanding and that, above all, They're not always seen. Sometime later, my friend told me that she found toys lying around her house that hadn't even belonged to her. So, yeah, I met the ghost of a child. So there are some things going on in our house. We've owned the house for four years. I've always felt uneasy about our bedroom closet. I've kept that door shut because it gives me the creeps when I have to get up and pass it to go to the bathroom. 
First on experience, heard three heavy steps come from the closet towards my bed. I wasn't asleep. Scared me half to death. Second on experience, we have a very old grandfather clock that hasn't worked for years. It's not wound. It hasn't been working. Weights are at the bottom. My husband and I were eating lunch in the kitchen and the grandfather clock all of a sudden struck 12. Third on experience, we heard my stepson's very unusual cackle laugh from upstairs. He was out of town and not here. His laugh is very distinct. My husband and I both heard it. Fourth on experience, we had a friend over a heavy glass flew across the bar without any of us close to us. It hit our fridge with such force, it dented our refrigerator in three different places. Wigged us out, but our friend more so. He doesn't want to visit anymore. Fifth odd experience. I was the only one home besides my dogs. We were all downstairs, and I had distinctive footsteps walking upstairs. Sixth odd experience. At 8.25 tonight, my husband and I were sitting around watching Parks and Recs with sleeping puppy dogs. We're downstairs. We heard an incredibly loud noise. It literally sounded like someone jumped off the bed upstairs or fell hard on the floor. My husband investigated every room and every closet and checked to see if anything fell. There's nothing we have upstairs that could fall and sound that hard that we have on any walls. The pictures are still on the walls. I started to get scared. Any clues on what on earth could be doing this? Ghost? Demon? I was on my way to work, just as normal as any other day. Same time, same route, same music, same coffee. Almost made it there too. In all honesty, I don't remember what made me drive off the road and into a ditch, totaling my car. I don't remember the crash. I swear to this day I made it to the next stop sign and got behind a black Dodge Challenger and made the next right turn behind it. It must have been an out-of-body experience because my car and I were in a ditch 20 to 30 feet before that stop sign. Fast forward, I woke up in the hospital, disoriented and confused. I'd never been in a hospital bed staring at the ceiling before, so I guess I was asked the routine questions, do you know where you are? My smart ass always having something to say, it's not heaven, I probably wouldn't be going there. Hospital? Do you know why you're here? And for the love of all that's good, I couldn't remember one single bit of it. I legitimately thought I made it to that stop sign, didn't even know I had a car accident. No, what happened? Is there anyone you'd like us to contact? I didn't remember that I was married, much less remember the name of my spouse. But it was at this moment when I looked up and saw at the foot of my bed, three large shadows. There was one officer at the window to my left, two nurses on my right between the bed and the wall, and the doctor was at my hip to my left. I asked, why so many people? The doctor said the nurses had to be there, and the cop had to do a report. I pointed at the shadows at the foot of my bed, but they were gone now. The doc confirmed, there's nobody there. Still dazed and confused, the officer, now standing at my hip and the doctor at the foot of the bed, told me I was in a car accident. So I asked if there was anyone else injured. People in the other vehicle, walking pedestrians, God forgive me if I hit an innocent animal. Lord knows we have deer, fox and bunnies in the area. No, just you. It was just you. I'm a person with a good heart, so maybe it was the relief that I didn't hurt anyone else. I started to cry. The officer kindly wished me a speedy recovery and made his way out. I wiped my tears, opened my eyes, and like the worst jump scare in a 3D movie, there was an old man in my face repeatedly saying, Help me. I froze up. I felt my heart skip a beat. Hair stood up on my arms, legs and neck. I sensed my blood pressure drop and the heart monitor made its noise. Trying to evaluate the situation as best I could, as quick as I could, I looked around. The nurses who were to my right were gone. 
I must have missed the moment they left. To my left was the old man in full body apparition. It wasn't just him. There were four phantoms asking me for help. Three male and one female. They all had clothing like the kind you would see in the Civil War history book era. The nurses rushed in because of the beeping machine attached to me and I passed out. When I woke up, there was a surgeon telling me the extent of my injuries, which I don't feel are relevant for this writing, so I'll leave them out. I asked him to send up the hospital priest. He tried to press for information as to why I wanted the priest, but I simply told him I wanted someone to pray for me. Again, I passed out. The time lapses between passing out and waking up were never clear to me. When, when I woke up again, the priest was there with me. He stood to my right in plain clothes, asked why I wanted him there. I asked him to close the door. After he did, I told him everything I saw. The shadow people, the old man, and the three with them asking for help. I asked the priest to pray for any lost souls, to bless the room I laid in, and to bless me with holy water. He told me he understood my concern and would pray for me, and come back to check on me. I spent another three weeks laying in that hospital bed, passing out and waking up. After making a full recovery, I've gone back to the hospital to visit the cathedral and thank the priest. I don't know if the prayers by the priest helped. I can only hope they did. After spending a few years living abroad with my father, I returned to my native country. I was ready to start my adult life. From zero. From my mother's guest room. I was then in my early 20s. She had recently moved into a new apartment. The building was newly built on the edge of the city. It was nice. High ceilings, large rooms, quiet neighbourhood, though on the edge of the bad side of town. Rumour is that the area used to be known for prostitution, drugs and the occasional dead body. Until this new building came around. Given my experiences and boredom, mostly boredom, I decided to try to see if I could connect with anyone. Stupid me. I drew up a flimsy Ouija board on paper and used my own gold ring as a pointer. Didn't look worthy of making contact with the bottom of a garbage can. It's a Ouija. It doesn't have to look special. If it's meant to make contact and something's there, there's a chance you just might. And you may not like the results. I spent two minutes drawing the letters, the words yes, no, goodbye, and probably ten minutes talking to what I thought was nothing. I'm very impatient. I asked typical weird questions. Hello? Is there anybody here with me? Are there any spirits who would like to communicate with me? And so on. Never getting any response, I said goodbye, tore up the paper, and that was the end of that. Or so I thought. Days went by, and little things started happening. I felt as if I wasn't alone. I started seeing shadows in the corner of my peripheral vision. But being who I am and having had the experiences I've had, I didn't think much of it. It didn't scare or faze me one bit. Days became weeks. Weeks became months of this. And with the time, my paranoia settled in. As this time I was struggling to find work, and being a burden to my mother took a toll on both of us. Stress levels in the home were consistently growing. There were occasions when I would hear kids running just outside my bedroom door. So I'd get up, open the door, and there'd be nothing there. I'd be as quiet as possible to see if I could hear kids at all. Nothing. I'd run outside, no kids, no movement, silence. At this point, I knew what was going on. I knew I opened a gateway for someone or something to communicate with me. This is why I don't believe that saying goodbye after ending a session will close or end communications. It's bullshit. If something wants to communicate, it will. Many times I'd be asleep in bed and wake up because I felt someone pull my leg. Nobody there, but I'd have a big bruise on my leg. These just kept getting more and more intense. 
on one occasion, I got caught off guard. I was just getting out of the shower. The bathroom doorknob jostled as if someone was trying to rush into the bathroom. I froze, looking at the doorknob. I knew I was alone, and so there's now hair standing up on the back of my neck and goosebumps down my spine. And immediately after, I heard a little girl laugh as she ran away from the door. For a split second, my heart stopped. I snapped myself out of the stunned scare and flung the door open. I tried my best not to emit any sense of fear and tried to shrug it off. I put on music with a happy tone, got dressed and played my favourite video game to take my mind off what had just happened. Soon after this occurrence, I found work, which was a bit of a relief. It meant I didn't have to be in that apartment as much. I worked long hours, I came home, slept, woke up and went back to work. The leg pulls, bruises, shadows, it all continued. Not daily, but it did. I said enough in the morning I woke up to see little red claw marks on the wall and ceiling. That was the signal to get out. It looked like something with three fingernails took an uppercut swipe at the wall and also skimmed the ceiling in one swing. I went to get a chair to get a closer look. Think of an oversized cat's nails leaving crayon marks. This was before Facebook existed, so taking a picture wasn't something easily accessible. From that moment, I began to work the idea into my mother's head that she deserved an upgrade in life. So I got my boss to help find a place closer to work, and that was that. A month later, we were out of there. Lucky me. Whatever it was, it didn't follow. As far as I know, my mother never experienced anything. She never seemed out of the ordinary, and I never told her. This is from many, many years ago. She's since died of natural causes. She lived for many years after we moved out. May she rest in peace. I don't know exactly how old I was. Too young to know much about death, if anything at all. I'll try not to make this drag out too long while providing proper detail. A boy in my class had passed. How? I don't know. And my mom took me to the ceremonies. It was one of those where they had the funeral services and then the burial immediately after, because it's all on the same property. For some reason we were late, so I didn't see the boy in the casket. We made it just in time to accompany everyone else outside to the burial grounds on foot. The slow walk had me bored, so I started playing tag with one of the other kids. I didn't recognise him at the moment as my classmate. He had on a sailor suit and seemed happy to see me. I remember that after a while, my mother called my name, came running after me and grabbed me by my arm, scolding me. I told her I was just playing with the boy, but now he was gone. What boy? Stop lying. Behave yourself. Blah, blah, blah. A young man, probably early 20s, intervened in my mother's lecture. I don't remember the words verbatim, but it was him asking, What boy? You're the only kid here. This got more people's attention, including that of an older lady, and her attention drew a crowd. She turned out to be the boy's grandmother. The young man and the grandmother insisted on knowing what little boy. They told me calmly to look around, and repeatedly told me I was the only child there. The grandmother asked me to describe the boy. When I mentioned his sailor suit, it rang a bell. The 20 year old said that the little boy they were burying had a sailor suit. Then the grandmother agreed. Everyone began talking among each other in a worrisome excitement, trying to figure out what was going on. I was confused about what was going on. The grandmother asked me if I would recognise the boy I was playing tag with and had someone else bring a picture. I couldn't recognise him though and scared that I had done something wrong. I didn't answer. The grandmother ordered for the coffin to be opened. A yelling lady protested, I'm guessing his mother. But in the end, they, guessing again, groundskeepers, raised the coffin above ground level and got it opened. They asked me if the boy laying there was the boy I was playing with. This is probably why I remember this so vividly. Fucking traumatised. Anyway, 
Then I saw the boy appear again, holding his grandmother's hand at the other end of the coffin. Then just as quickly as he appeared, he was gone again when I looked up at the grandmother to tell her he was right there holding her hand. My mother escorted me away from the coffin. In the meantime, the coffin was closed again and began to be lowered. The grandmother reached in and gave me a hug and a flower, told me to throw it into the grave. It took me a minute to react, but I did. Then, my mum had me say goodbye to everyone and we left early. Years later, my mother still denies this ever happened. It's something both my dad and I do where we seemingly skip around in space-time. I've even got eyewitness confirmation of one of these events. The earliest I was made aware of this phenomenon was a story dad told of when he and mom were first dating. They lived in different parts of town and he could pretty much only go one way from hers to his. After dropping her off one day and heading his usual way home, he's suddenly in a different part of town heading the opposite direction. All my life, my dad had a habit of disappearing. And not in the I'm going out for smokes kind of way, but in the you can walk past the chair he's in four times and only see him once kind of way. It's the more concrete examples that blow my mind. One time, I was busy cleaning my room when I suddenly heard dad screaming frantically. He had apparently been looking for me for 30 minutes, screaming and yelling the whole time, freaking out. At one point, he was even in my room. We would have both been standing in the centre of my room. Neither of us could see or hear the other. Same week, I'm laying in bed, actively listening to the TV show my parents are watching downstairs. Without a word, mom gets in her car and leaves. She comes back with takeouts and says she got me whatever because I wouldn't answer her. She even told me she turned the TV all the way down, thinking I couldn't hear her. From my perspective, that never happened. The volume never changed. Recently, in the apartment my girlfriend and I rented together, she witnessed my shifting. I was washing dishes when she pulled into the driveway. I waited a minute before going to the door to greet her, except she wasn't there. Assuming she must still be in her car, I left the door cracked and went back to finish the dishes. No sooner than I had turned around, she was coming in the door behind me. I asked her about what happened, what she saw, and she told me she saw the front door come out while she was backing into the driveway, not after. It's like I perceive time as linear, but I don't always experience it as such. It also seems to happen more frequently as I get older. It's something both my dad and I do where we seemingly skip around in space-time. I've even got eyewitness confirmation of one of these events. The earliest I was made aware of this phenomenon was a story dad told of when he and mom were first dating. They lived in different parts of town and he could pretty much only go one way from hers to his. After dropping her off one day and heading his usual way home, he's suddenly in a different part of town heading the opposite direction. All my life, my dad had a habit of disappearing. And not in the I'm going out for smokes kind of way, but in the you can walk past the chair he's in four times and only see him once kind of way. It's the more concrete examples that blow my mind. One time, I was busy cleaning my room when I suddenly heard dad screaming frantically. He had apparently been looking for me for 30 minutes, screaming and yelling the whole time, freaking out. At one point, he was even in my room. We would have both been standing in the centre of my room. Neither of us could see or hear the other. Same week, I'm laying in bed, actively listening to the TV show my parents are watching downstairs. Without a word, mom gets in her car and leaves. She comes back with takeouts and says she got me whatever because I wouldn't answer her. She even told me she turned the TV all the way down, thinking I couldn't hear her. From my perspective, that never happened. 
The volume never changed. Recently, in the apartment my girlfriend and I rented together, she witnessed my shifting. I was washing dishes when she pulled into the driveway. I waited a minute before going to the door to greet her, except she wasn't there. Assuming she must still be in her car, I left the door cracked and went back to finish the dishes. No sooner than I had turned around, she was coming in the door behind me. I asked her about what happened, what she saw, and she told me she saw the front door come out while she was backing into the driveway, not after. It's like I perceive time as linear, but I don't always experience it as such. It also seems to happen more frequently as I get older. The other night, I let my dogs out in the backyard so they could run and use the restroom. Like an hour later, they're barking like crazy. My dogs normally bark, but generally only if there's a person or another dog. And even then, the barking they were doing the other night sounded really aggressive. Like they were fighting something or were scared. I went to let them in as I didn't want them to wake my mom, who was sleeping upstairs. I didn't really think anything of it. Until tonight at dinner, when my mom told me she had been awoken by the dogs. She told me that she went to the window that looks out over the backyard to hush the dogs, which she saw something in our backyard. She described it as having an Afghan wolfhound-like body, but with shaved hair, and moving like a sloth, but faster. On a whim, I showed her a picture of the old creepy paste of the rake, and she agreed that that's what it looked like if it had blonde fur. The sloth movements also reminded me of a story I'd heard about a Wendigo, and how they had puppet-like movements. She told me that after the dog started to growl at it, the thing awkwardly manoeuvred its body up the back fence, into the park behind our house, up a few houses to the right, where another neighbour with dogs was, before retracting and going to the empty plot directly to the right of us, and seemingly disappearing. A few other important pieces of information that might help. I live in an area that is situated just outside the town, but it has a pretty dense forest surrounding it that is fenced off due to being military property. The plot next to us is a drain area that's covered in thick, tall grass. This also isn't the first time that we've seen something strange in our neighbourhood. Family and guests always say they see several shadow figures along the streets, and my sister and I once saw a very weird deer at the park. To go more in depth about the deer, it was young without antlers, and was very light coloured. My sister and I went to the park where it seemed like it had gotten stuck and couldn't leave. The park is fenced in, since it belongs to the school. Once we entered, the deer started running straight at us, but then changed its mind and left the park like it hadn't been unable to moments prior. We watched it for a little while, just to make sure it didn't get hit, before walking up the hill to our house, and it started following us again. It could be nothing. It's just weird behaviour for the deer in this area, who will usually run away the second you even turn towards them. It was also strange that such a young looking deer was by itself, when usually the mothers can be found with them. I'm not saying it was a not deer or anything, but my sister and I had joked about it at the moment as we're both avid cryptid fans. That all happened like a month ago, and the only reason I bring it up now is because its appearance at night would look a lot like the creature my mother had described. The other night, I let my dogs out in the backyard so they could run and use the restroom. Like an hour later, they're barking like crazy. My dogs normally bark, but generally only if there's a person or another dog. And even then, the barking they were doing the other night sounded really aggressive, like they were fighting something or were scared. I went to let them in as I didn't want them to wake my mom, who was sleeping upstairs. I didn't really think anything of it, until tonight at dinner, when my mom told me she had been awoken by the dogs. She told me that she went to the window that looks out over the backyard to hush the dogs, which she saw something in our backyard. 
She described it as having an Afghan wolfhound-like body, but with shaved hair, and moving like a sloth, but faster. On a whim, I showed her a picture of the old creepy paste of the rake, and she agreed that that's what it looked like if it had blonde fur. The sloth movements also reminded me of a story I'd heard about a Wendigo, and how they had puppet-like movements. She told me that after the dog started to growl at it, the thing awkwardly manoeuvred its body up the back fence, into the park behind our house, up a few houses to the right, where another neighbourhood dogs was, before retracting and going to the empty plot directly to the right of us, and seemingly disappearing. A few other important pieces of information that might help. I live in an area that is situated just outside the town, but it has a pretty dense forest surrounding it that is fenced off due to being military property. The plot next to us is a drain area that's covered in thick, tall grass. This also isn't the first time that we've seen something strange in our neighbourhood. Family and guests always say they see several shadow figures along the street, and my sister and I once saw a very weird deer at the park. To go more in depth about the deer, it was young without antlers and was very light coloured. My sister and I went to the park where it seemed like it had gotten stuck and couldn't leave. The park is fenced in since it belongs to the school. Once we entered, the deer started running straight at us, but then changed its mind and left the park like it hadn't been unable to moments prior. We watched it for a little while just to make sure it didn't get hit before walking up the hill to our house and it started following us again. It could be nothing. It's just weird behaviour for the deer in this area, who will usually run away the second you even turn towards them. It was also strange that such a young looking deer was by itself, when usually the mothers can be found with them. I'm not saying it was a not deer or anything, but my sister and I had joked about it at the moment as we're both avid cryptid fans. That all happened like a month ago, and the only reason I bring it up now is because its appearance at night would look a lot like the creature my mother had described. Ever since I was a small child, I've always dealt with paranormal experiences. It seems like no matter where I move, there's always paranormal shit waiting to happen. Whether it be shadows in the corner of my eye, or things flying off shelves for absolutely no reason. As previously mentioned, I had experiences that ranged from items flying off counters or moving in front of me, all the way to hearing my name called by three different voices in the middle of the night while I was home alone. Voices that I've never heard in my life. I recently moved in with family members due to COVID. Almost immediately after I moved in, all types of different occurrences began happening in this house. As silly as this sounds, every time I speak of these ghosts or whatever they are, technology all around me begins to malfunction. And only when I speak of them, for example, my TV and computer monitors would freeze or just straight up shut off by themselves. They're both no older than a year each. I tried to test the phenomenon by chatting with a good friend on the phone. We were chatting for 50 or so minutes. We were chatting about family. No problems whatsoever. Once we hit the one hour mark on the call, I started chatting with him about activity I've witnessed in the past. Sure enough, the call dropped. Dropped, not ended. I called back, continued on with my story. Sure enough again, the call dropped again. This process happened approximately 11 or 12 more times. After the last time, I left my room to go ask if any of my family members were experiencing technology errors. Apparently, I was the only one. When I mentioned I was telling a good friend paranormal experiences I've had in the past, my mom went and put an open Bible in my room. After that, my calls stopped dropping. Just for the record, I normally have amazing internet and phone service. For the next three days while the Bible was in my room, the living room just outside my bedroom had things fly off shelves and counters almost daily, even when I was home alone. 
When I removed the Bible after three days, the activity seemed to calm down. Don't get me wrong, I'm happy to see things calm down. But there's rooms in my house that my dog absolutely refuses to enter. I've always assumed maybe I'm just bad luck. Or perhaps maybe someone that disliked me passed away. But to this day, I have no idea. I just keep telling myself quarantine might just be taking a mental toll on me. But my family has witnessed things falling too. There's so much more I'd like to type. But at this point, my iPhone is lagging so bad it's taking two seconds for every letter typed. If anyone has any opinions or advice, I'll be happy to reply to everyone. Ever since I was a small child, I've always dealt with paranormal experiences. It seems like no matter where I move, there's always paranormal shit waiting to happen. Whether it be shadows in the corner of my eye or things flying off shelves for absolutely no reason. As previously mentioned, I had experiences that ranged from items flying off counters or moving in front of me, all the way to hearing my name called by three different voices in the middle of the night while I was home alone. Voices that I've never heard in my life. I recently moved in with family members due to COVID. Almost immediately after I moved in, all types of different occurrences began happening in this house. As silly as this sounds, Every time I speak of these ghosts or whatever they are, technology all around me begins to malfunction. And only when I speak of them, for example, my TV and computer monitors would freeze or just straight up shut off by themselves. They're both no older than a year each. I tried to test the phenomenon by chatting with a good friend on the phone. We were chatting for 50 or so minutes. We were chatting about family, no problems whatsoever. Once we hit the one hour mark on the call, I started chatting with him about activity I've witnessed in the past. Sure enough, the call dropped. Dropped, not ended. I called back, continued on with my story. Sure enough again, the call dropped again. This process happened approximately 11 or 12 more times. After the last time, I left my room to go ask if any of my family members were experiencing technology errors. Apparently... I was the only one. When I mentioned I was telling a good friend paranormal experiences I've had in the past, my mom went and put an open Bible in my room. After that, my calls stopped dropping. Just for the record, I normally have amazing internet and phone service. For the next three days while the Bible was in my room, the living room just outside my bedroom had things fly off shelves and counters almost daily, even when I was home alone. When I removed the Bible after three days, the activity seemed to calm down. Don't get me wrong, I'm happy to see things calm down, but there's rooms in my house that my dog absolutely refuses to enter. I've always assumed maybe I'm just bad luck, or perhaps maybe someone that disliked me passed away. But to this day, I have no idea. I just keep telling myself quarantine might just be taking a mental toll on me, but my family has witnessed things falling too. There's so much more I'd like to type, but at this point, my iPhone is lagging so bad it's taking two seconds for every letter typed. If anyone has any opinions or advice, I'll be happy to reply to everyone. This is the second time it's happened in the last six months or so. About an hour ago, 12.30 at night, I was in bed and my cat, who almost always insists on sleeping at the foot of my bed, woke me up amongst the midst of severe nightmares I was trapped in. I don't usually have an issue waking up when I have a bad dream, but two times, I haven't been able to wake up on my own. I don't know what it could be. It started as an awful dream, pulling someone away from jumping off a building, trying to kill themselves. And when I eventually woke up, I would immediately fall asleep again and on to the next nightmare. I didn't have the strength to wake myself up fully, but I could feel my heart racing as each one was progressively getting worse and worse, to the point I was dreaming about running and hiding from something with people I'd never met before and hearing footsteps closing in and sudden screaming. 
Then I could hear my cat Jones meowing repeatedly, loud enough. It shook me out of the nightmare, and he wouldn't stop till I hugged him for a while. He calmed down, but suddenly stood up, looked across the room, and stared at nothing for a moment, and then looked at the other side and started again. I haven't been able to sleep since, but Jones has calmed down and fallen asleep, so whatever it was, it's gone now. This is the second time it's happened in the last six months or so. About an hour ago, 12.30 at night, I was in bed and my cat, who almost always insists on sleeping at the foot of my bed, woke me up amongst the midst of severe nightmares I was trapped in. I don't usually have an issue waking up when I have a bad dream, but two times I haven't been able to wake up on my own. I don't know what it could be. It started as an awful dream, pulling someone away from jumping off a building, trying to kill themselves. And when I eventually woke up, I would immediately fall asleep again and onto the next nightmare. I didn't have the strength to wake myself up fully, but I could feel my heart racing as each one was progressively getting worse and worse, to the point I was dreaming about running and hiding from something with people I'd never met before and hearing footsteps closing in and sudden screaming. Then I could hear my cat Jones meowing repeatedly, loud enough it shook me out of the nightmare and he wouldn't stop till I hugged him for a while. He calmed down but suddenly stood up, looked across the room and stared at nothing for a moment and then looked at the other side and started again. I haven't been able to sleep since, but Jones has calmed down and fallen asleep, so whatever it was, it's gone now. Early this year, my friend's sister passed away. I've known the sister for a long time and found her friendly, outgoing and charismatic. She always stood up for herself, but in a way that didn't make you feel like she was attacking you. So about a month ago, my friend had a girls night and we hung out at her mother's house. As the evening wore on, they insisted that I stay the night. They offered me the sister's room, but said if I felt off about it, I could sleep elsewhere. I said that the sister and I always got along fine. She didn't scare me, and I'm sure she wouldn't mind. Sometime during the night, I woke up when I felt the room temperature drop, and I got chilled. Well, I'm in my 50s, and thanks to menopause, it has to be really cold for me to get chilled. Then I felt a cold presence next to the bed, and I knew it was the sister. I heard my friend from the other room ask if I was okay and I told her that her sister was in the room. She told me to tell her to go away. I said that this was her room and she had every right to stay, and that I didn't mind sharing. Then I felt her lay down in the bed next to me. It took a while for the chill to dissipate, but I eventually fell back asleep. The next morning, I told my friend and her mother what happened. My friend said she doesn't remember that conversation with me, and that I might have dreamt it. Her mother, on the other hand, believed it and was very happy that her baby girl had joined us for the girls' night. Early this year, my friend's sister passed away. I've known the sister for a long time and found her friendly, outgoing and charismatic. She always stood up for herself, but in a way that didn't make you feel like she was attacking you. So about a month ago, my friend had a girls' night and we hung out at her mother's house. As the evening wore on, they insisted that I stay the night. They offered me the sister's room, but said if I felt off about it, I could sleep elsewhere. I said that the sister and I always got along fine. She didn't scare me, and I'm sure she wouldn't mind. Sometime during the night, I woke up when I felt the room temperature drop, and I got chilled. Well, I'm in my 50s, and thanks to menopause, it has to be really cold for me to get chilled. Then I felt a cold presence next to the bed, and I knew it was the sister. I heard my friend from the other room ask if I was okay, and I told her that her sister was in the room. She told me to tell her to go away. I said that this was her room and she had every right to stay, and that I didn't mind sharing. Then I felt her lay down in the bed next to me. It took a while for the chill to dissipate, but I eventually fell back asleep. 
The next morning, I told my friend and her mother what happened. My friend said she doesn't remember that conversation with me and that I might have dreamt it. Her mother, on the other hand, believed it and was very happy that her baby girl had joined us for the girls' night. My mom was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in 1999. She was stage four and doctors didn't give her much hope to live past three to six months. They started her on an aggressive form of treatments, including Rituxan. She responded well and went into remission in December 2000. About three months later, she got a really bad sore throat and relapsed. The cancer was back and more aggressive than ever. Fast forward to October 2001. My mom didn't come to work at our shop one day and wouldn't answer the house phone. I went to see her after work and the door was locked. She finally came to the door and was confused and dizzy. I rushed her to the hospital where we were told her cancer had broken the blood brain barrier. She was admitted and I was told she maybe had a few weeks to live. She had lost her ability to speak to me but she knew who I was. They tried an experimental treatment and it worked for a few days and she was speaking and very aware of her surroundings and me. I knew it was going to be over soon and she even said, I've raised you right and it's time for me to go soon. My dad had passed a few months before suddenly and it was the worst year of my life. I came to see her the next day and could hear her talking in German and thought one of her friends was visiting. I came into the room and no one was there. I asked her, who are you talking to? She said Papa and started giggling. I said, yeah, okay, and sat with her. The next day, she had a massive seizure and almost bit her tongue off. They had to place a stint in her mouth, then place her under anesthesia to stop the seizures. She passed at 5 a.m. on November 2nd, 2001. I was comforted by the excellent nurses in the hospice and told them she must have been losing it because she was talking to herself. The nurses looked at each other and said she did it all the time. She would have full-blown conversations with someone for hours on end. They asked her who she was talking to and she said her dad and that he'd be seeing her soon. Problem is, her dad was killed in w- World War II, Holland, on November 1st, 1944. The nurses also told me they thought they heard a man's voice in her room at times, but when they entered, no one was there and she had a huge smile on her face. I miss her dearly, but I know she's in a better place, free of that misery. I really appreciate all the feedback I got. So much of it was heartfelt, positive and warm. I always get a bit melancholy around the time of her death anniversary. Writing this story makes me feel a bit better about the whole thing. And I hope it helps others cope during the holidays a little bit better. My mom was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in 1999. She was stage four and doctors didn't give her much hope to live past three to six months. They started her on an aggressive form of treatments, including Rituxan. She responded well and went into remission in December 2000. About three months later, She got a really bad sore throat and relapsed. The cancer was back and more aggressive than ever. Fast forward to October 2001. My mom didn't come to work at our shop one day and wouldn't answer the house phone. I went to see her after work and the door was locked. She finally came to the door and was confused and dizzy. I rushed her to the hospital where we were told her cancer had broken the blood brain barrier. She was admitted and I was told she maybe had a few weeks to live. She had lost her ability to speak to me, but she knew who I was. They tried an experimental treatment and it worked for a few days and she was speaking and very aware of her surroundings and me. I knew it was going to be over soon and she even said, I've raised you right and it's time for me to go soon. My dad had passed a few months before suddenly and it was the worst year of my life. I came to see her the next day and could hear her talking in German and thought one of her friends was visiting. I came into the room and no one was there. 
I asked her, who are you talking to? She said Papa and started giggling. I said, yeah, okay, and sat with her. The next day, she had a massive seizure and almost bit her tongue off. They had to place a stint in her mouth, then place her under anesthesia to stop the seizures. She passed at 5am on November 2nd, 2001. I was comforted by the excellent nurses in the hospice and told them she must have been losing it because she was talking to herself. The nurses looked at each other and said she did it all the time. She would have full-blown conversations with someone for hours on end. They asked her who she was talking to and she said, her dad, and that he'd be seeing her soon. Problem is, her dad was killed in w World War II, Holland, on November 1st, 1944. The nurses also told me they thought they heard a man's voice in her room at times, but when they entered, no one was there and she had a huge smile on her face. I miss her dearly, but I know she's in a better place, free of that misery. I really appreciate all the feedback I got. So much of it was heartfelt, positive and warm. I always get a bit melancholy around the time of her death anniversary. Writing this story makes me feel a bit better about the whole thing. And I hope it helps others cope during the holidays a little bit better. Now to what I experienced. I think it was maybe around three years ago. I remember it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family's cabin while we others went Christmas shopping for food and last minute packages for some friends or something. I don't really remember why they went out, but that's not important. My point is, I was all alone in our cabin, playing some games on my phone, while listening to some music on the radio in my room, on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that I suddenly got cold and went to get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just when I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow in my side vision. I didn't really care that much because I thought that maybe it was just my imagination playing a trick on me because I didn't really like being alone in general and especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About one hour passed and I'd forgotten about all the strange shadow but when I saw it again, this time it stayed in my side vision for about 3-5 to five seconds before it went away again. I got a little creeped out about it since I was the only one in the cabin at the moment. Therefore, I decided to lock the room to my door. Right after I locked the door to my room, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first, I thought it was my little sister who was about 3 years old at the time. She used to cry a lot and I asked out loud, What's wrong? Did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer yes. I feel while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed towards the stairs when it finally hit me. I was alone in the cabin, so whatever the fuck was upstairs could not be my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt and my dad's slippers, and it was freezing cold outside. I stopped running about 150 metres away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, I could see a shadow just standing still, and I got the feeling it was staring at me, even though I could not make out any eyes. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for about 30 minutes and cried until my family finally arrived. My mum and dad asked me what was wrong, but... I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I remember is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin, because I refused to enter the cabin. Ever since that day, I refused to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling I got that day in the cabin can only be described as not wanting like someone or something wanted to harm me. And I have nightmares about the shadow figure thing, even today. It's haunting my dreams. Now to what I experienced. 
I think it was maybe around three years ago. I remember it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family's cabin while we others went Christmas shopping for food and last minute packages for some friends or something. I don't really remember why they went out, but that's not important. My point is, I was all alone in our cabin, playing some games on my phone while listening to some music on the radio in my room, on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that I suddenly got cold and went to get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just as I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow in my side vision. I didn't really care that much because I thought that maybe it was just my imagination playing a trick on me because I didn't really like being alone in general and especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About one hour passed and I'd forgotten about all the strange shadow but when I saw it again, this time it stayed in my side vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I got a little creeped out about it since I was the only one in the cabin at the moment. Therefore, I decided to lock the room to my door. Right after I locked the door to my room, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first, I thought it was my little sister who was about three years old at the time. She used to cry a lot and I asked out loud, What's wrong? Did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer, Yes. I feel while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed towards the stairs when it finally hit me. I was alone in the cabin, so whatever the fuck was upstairs could not be my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt and my dad's slippers, and it was freezing cold outside. I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, I could see a shadow just standing still and I got the feeling it was staring at me, even though I could not make out any eyes. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for about 30 minutes and cried until my family finally arrived. My mum and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I remember is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin because I refused to enter the cabin. Ever since that day, I refuse to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling I got that day in the cabin can only be described as not wanting. Like someone or something wanted to harm me. And I have nightmares about the shadow figure thing, even today. It's haunting my dreams. So this took place at my cousin's old house when I was seven and my cousin was six. My whole family was there and they were all outside getting drunk. So no one was really paying attention to all the kids. There were five kids there at the time. My cousin and I thought it would be fun to try on her old Halloween costumes. So we started running upstairs and when we got to the third step, we bumped into something and we were thrown down the stairs. It literally felt like we bumped into a pole and then got pushed off the stairs. So we were laying on the ground, hurt, trying to process what just happened. But we thought we just slipped or something. So we stood up and looked towards the stairs and saw a ghost standing on the third step. The ghost was standing very formally and didn't move a muscle. I don't remember much except that the ghost was dressed as a pilot. And the most vivid part I remember his shoes were extremely shiny. Me and my cousin screamed like we were getting murdered and my other cousin Jay, 11 at the time, rushed from the kitchen and asked what was going on. We couldn't word a mouth, we were terrified. Jay looked up at the stairs and saw the ghost and screamed. My mother ran to us to see what was going on so we explained what we saw and she thought we were just messing around and went back outside. Three years later, I was talking about it with my two cousins who also saw what I saw, and they said that they didn't remember that at all. I was confused and terrified 
because I knew that it actually happened. And I was curious as to why they didn't remember what happened. Three days later, I was still staying at my cousin's house and I saw the ghost in the kitchen, but my cousin Jay didn't see him. So I brushed it off and we went back to her room. That was the last time I saw him. Last year, I was talking to my cousin M, Jay's sister, and she said that her great uncle was a pilot and died when I was about four. And we think that's who I saw. That experience still terrifies me to this day. And every time I tell someone, they don't believe me. So this took place at my cousin's old house when I was seven and my cousin was six. My whole family was there and they were all outside getting drunk. So no one was really paying attention to all the kids. There were five kids there at the time. My cousin and I thought it would be fun to try on her old Halloween costumes. So we started running upstairs and when we got to the third step, we bumped into something and we were thrown down the stairs. It literally felt like we bumped into a pole and then got pushed off the stairs. So we were laying on the ground hurt, trying to process what just happened. But we thought we just slipped or something. So we stood up and looked towards the stairs and saw a ghost standing on the third step. The ghost was standing very formally and didn't move a muscle. I don't remember much except that the ghost was dressed as a pilot. And the most vivid part I remember is his shoes were extremely shiny. Me and my cousin screamed like we were getting murdered. And my other cousin, Jay, 11 at the time, rushed from the kitchen and asked what was going on. We couldn't word a mouth. We were terrified. Jay looked up at the stairs and saw the ghost and screamed. My mother ran to us to see what was going on. So we explained what we saw and she thought we were just messing around and went back outside. Three years later, I was talking about it with my two cousins who also saw what I saw. And they said that they didn't remember that at all. I was confused and terrified because I knew that it actually happened. And I was curious as to why they didn't remember what happened. Three days later, I was still staying at my cousin's house and I saw the ghost in the kitchen, but my cousin Jay didn't see him. So I brushed it off and we went back to her room. That was the last time I saw him. Last year, I was talking to my cousin M, Jay's sister. And she said that her great uncle was a pilot and died when I was about four. And we think that's who I saw. That experience still terrifies me to this day. And every time I tell someone, they don't believe me. In April 2020, my partner and I sadly lost a son at 17 weeks gestation. I had an infection in my uterus, which was undetected, and after several days in hospital with some worrying symptoms, I went into premature labor. I was also septic, so after delivering our boy, I was very unwell. To say it was tragic and traumatic would be an understatement. We named him, and for the purposes of this post, we'll call him H. At the time, my older son, A, was two and a half years old, too young to really understand anything except that mummy was sick in hospital. We haven't purposefully not told him about H. We will in time, but there was no reason to confuse him at such a young age. We don't talk a lot about H at home. H is not a name that is familiar to our older son for any reason. Around July this year, I was driving A to a Saturday morning activity when he said, Mummy, you should meet my friend H, he's here in the car with us, and pointed to the ceiling of the car. I didn't want to overreact or ask too much in case he felt the need to make things up, so I simply said, that's good, eh? Is he a nice friend? And he said yes. I told my partner, and we both had the same reaction. Weird coincidence, but also, kids have imaginary friends often, not a big deal. Next day, A told my partner that H is here when they were playing in our lounge room. My partner asked, oh, okay, where is he now? And A pointed in the air to the corner of the room, above where we kept H's ashes on top of our bookshelf, and then said, he's like an astronaut, he can float in space. 
A few days later, when my partner took A off to childcare, I gave A a kiss and hug, as I always do at the front door. A then turned to his left and enthusiastically said, Bye H, I'm off to school, before running out the door. By now, my partner and I are just looking at each other in amazement. Over the next few weeks, this happened several more times. Sometimes A told us that H is asleep, so would stay in the car if we arrived at our destination. A also told me that H was in hospital, not an astronaut anymore. This time freaked me out a little as, of course, the only time we could hold H was in hospital. Our only memories of him physically were in that setting. But mostly, these visitations felt special and a bit magical. The final time H visited, that we know of, occurred in the car again. Just A and I. He told me, H is here with us, mummy. And curiosity got the better of me. I asked, A, is H a man or a little boy like you? And he said to me, with a tone like I really should know this already, No, mummy, H is just a little baby. Sometimes I can hold him. And he cradled his arms like he was holding a small baby. That was absolutely an oh shit, but also a wow moment. I was raised agnostic atheist, so it's all a bit overwhelming to ponder on too much. But we have decided it was H just letting us know he's okay, and with us still, somehow. A few weeks later, I found out I was pregnant again. I like to think H was here with us through the early weeks, and is still with us still. Always a special part of our family. I do believe young children can see things we can't explain. I'm so glad A had this chance, though we most likely won't remember it. In April 2020, my partner and I sadly lost a son at 17 weeks gestation. I had an infection in my uterus, which was undetected, and after several days in hospital with some worrying symptoms, I went into premature labour. I was also septic, so after delivering our boy, I was very unwell. To say it was tragic and traumatic would be an understatement. We named him, and for the purposes of this post, we'll call him H. At the time, my older son A was two and a half years old. Too young to really understand anything except that mummy was sick in hospital. We haven't purposefully not told him about H. We will in time but there was no reason to confuse him at such a young age. We don't talk a lot about H at home. H is not a name that is familiar to our older son for any reason. Around July this year, I was driving A to a Saturday morning activity when he said, Mummy, you should meet my friend H. He's here in the car with us and pointed to the ceiling of the car. I didn't want to overreact or ask too much in case he felt the need to make things up. So I simply said, that's good, eh? Is he a nice friend? And he said, yes. I told my partner, and we both had the same reaction. Weird coincidence, but also, kids have imaginary friends often. Not a big deal. Next day, A told my partner that H is here, when they were playing in our lounge room. My partner asked, oh, okay, where is he now? And A pointed in the air to the corner of the room above where we kept H's ashes on top of our bookshelf, and then said, he's like an astronaut, he can float in space. A few days later, when my partner took A off to childcare, I gave A a kiss and hug, as I always do at the front door. A then turned to his left and enthusiastically said, bye H, I'm off to school, before running out the door. By now, my partner and I are just looking at each other in amazement. Over the next few weeks, this happened several more times. Sometimes A told us that H is asleep, so would stay in the car if we arrived at our destination. A also told me that H was in hospital, not an astronaut anymore. This time freaked me out a little as, of course, the only time we could hold H was in hospital. Our only memories of him physically were in that setting. But mostly, these visitations felt special and a bit magical. The final time H visited, that we know of, occurred in the car again. Just A and I. He told me, H is here with us, mummy. And curiosity got the better of me. I asked, 
Eh? Is H a man or a little boy like you? And he said to me, with a tone like I really should know this already, No, mommy, H is just a little baby. Sometimes I can hold him. And he cradled his arms like he was holding a small baby. That was absolutely an oh shit, but also a wow moment. I was raised agnostic atheist, so it's all a bit overwhelming to ponder on too much. But we have decided it was H just letting us know he's okay, and with us still, somehow. A few weeks later, I found out I was pregnant again. I like to think H was here with us through the early weeks, and is still with us still. Always a special part of our family. I do believe young children can see things we can't explain. I'm so glad A had this chance, though we most likely won't remember it. I'll just get to it. This happened a few months ago. My folks wanted to renovate my old room I used to sleep in when I lived with them. I went to help them out during the weekend with the renewal and all went smoothly. We threw away the old beds and furniture and gave them a fresh coat of paint. Since we threw out the old bed, I had to sleep in a different room. My mom offered for me to sleep on the couch, but I refused since it's very uncomfortable and I'm quite a large guy, so I decided I'll sleep downstairs. For context, the house is two stories. A ground floor with a guest bedroom, used to be my grandmother's bedroom, but she passed away. And a second floor where we basically used to live overall. Very rarely do we ever go to the ground floor. The floors are connected by stairs which are on the outside. There are no stairs on the inside. So I said goodnight and went down to the guest bedroom. I grabbed a snack and put on a TV series to watch. This goes on from about 10pm till 1.15 to 1.30am when I decide to sleep. I start drifting off to sleep when I suddenly hear a knock on the window. Three knocks like someone is asking if anyone's there. The knocking was very faint however, so I thought that it may have just been normal house noises, or just the wind since I was sleeping on an open window. About one to two minutes passed after the first knocking, and it goes again. Knock, knock, knock. I start getting a little anxious at this point, so I stand up and listen. A couple of minutes after the knocking, there's this inhuman growl from outside. It sounds like it's coming from the edges of the backyard. Then another couple of moments of silence, and then it knocks again. Now at this point, I'm starting to shit bricks, and this happening repeatedly, it knocks then growls on the other side of the backyard. So I text my girlfriend to try and share this with someone, so I get some stress off me at least. She tells me to record it. I made four recordings, and from my phone, I couldn't hear anything. The sound stopped after about 30 to 40 minutes. It wasn't easily falling asleep after that. The next day, I woke up to see if I could actually hear anything in the recordings. I enhanced one of them, and caught the growling. I'll just get to it. This happened a few months ago. My folks wanted to renovate my old room I used to sleep in when I lived with them. I went to help them out during the weekend with the renewal and all went smoothly. We threw away the old beds and furniture and gave them a fresh coat of paint. Since we threw out the old bed, I had to sleep in a different room. My mom offered for me to sleep on the couch, but I refused since it's very uncomfortable and I'm quite a large guy, so I decided I'll sleep downstairs. For context, the house is two stories. A ground floor with a guest bedroom, used to be my grandmother's bedroom, but she passed away. And a second floor where we basically used to live overall. Very rarely do we ever go to the ground floor. The floors are connected by stairs which are on the outside. There are no stairs on the inside. So I said goodnight and went down to the guest bedroom. I grabbed a snack and put on a TV series to watch. This goes on from about 10pm till 1.15 to 1.30am when I decide to sleep. I start drifting off to sleep when I suddenly hear a knock on the window. Three knocks like someone is asking if anyone's there. The knocking was very faint however, so I thought that it may have just been normal house noises, or just the wind since I was sleeping on an open window. About one to two minutes passed after the first knocking, and it goes again. 
Knock, knock, knock. I start getting a little anxious at this point, so I stand up and listen. A couple of minutes after the knocking, there's this inhuman growl from outside. It sounds like it's coming from the edges of the backyard. Then another couple of moments of silence, and then it knocks again. Now at this point, I'm starting to shit bricks, and this happening repeatedly, it knocks then growls on the other side of the backyard. So I text my girlfriend to try and share this with someone so I get some stress off me at least. She tells me to record it. I made four recordings, and from my phone, I couldn't hear anything. The sound stopped after about 30 to 40 minutes. It wasn't easily falling asleep after that. The next day, I woke up to see if I could actually hear anything in the recordings. I enhanced one of them and caught the growling. This happened maybe two years ago and was with, without a doubt the most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. Me and my at the time roommate were just finished working out. It was about 8pm and the sun had already gone down. After walking out of the gym, we decided to do a couple laps at the nearby stadium before we went home. Nothing obscure happens on the way there, but once the stadium comes within view, we realise the floodlights are turned off. This didn't deter us, as we were pretty certain we could run in the dark either way. We went to the bottom row of seats to leave our gym bags there. As we are placing our bags, we started hearing it. It was whistling, coming from the top rows right above us. Not only was the very fact that someone was sitting in the dark the entire time unnerving, but the very whistling itself was bone chilling. I don't know if I can explain it properly like this, but it was three low pitched whistles, then one higher pitch, then one lower pitched, and then it would repeat. It sounded like whatever was making it wanted us to come to it. We were thoroughly unnerved, so we whispered to each other to grab the bags and then jog to the other side of the stadium and get out. We took our bags and started jogging, and almost immediately afterwards, the whistling stopped. As I could hear nothing else but our feet stomping on the ground and heavy breathing, I just figured it had grown bored and went away. Just then, I started hearing something. I could hear a third set of feet running behind us. My stomach dropped as I realised whatever that was, was running towards us. Our adrenaline kicked in and we started booking it to the exit. As we were getting closer to the exit, I could hear it again, whistling but this time, 10 feet away from me. We made it past the exit and out on the streets, and we didn't quit running till another block down. We stopped to catch our breaths, and whatever was chasing us had quit at the stadium exit. Only me and my roommate know about this story. We've never really talked about it. That whistling is still the most disturbing thing I've ever heard in my life. This happened maybe two years ago and was with, without a doubt the most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. Me and my at the time roommate were just finished working out. It was about 8pm and the sun had already gone down. After walking out of the gym, we decided to do a couple laps at the nearby stadium before we went home. Nothing obscure happens on the way there, but once the stadium comes within view, we realise the floodlights are turned off. This didn't deter us, as we were pretty certain we could run in the dark either way. We went to the bottom row of seats to leave our gym bags there. As we were placing our bags, we started hearing it. It was whistling, coming from the top rows right above us. Not only was the very fact that someone was sitting in the dark the entire time unnerving, but the very whistling itself was bone chilling. I don't know if I can explain it properly like this, but it was three low pitched whistles, then one higher pitch, then one lower pitched, and then it would repeat. It sounded like whatever was making it wanted us to come to it. We were thoroughly unnerved, so we whispered to each other to grab the bags and then jog to the other side of the stadium and get out. 
We took our bags and started jogging, and almost immediately afterwards, the whistling stopped. As I could hear nothing else but our feet stomping on the ground and heavy breathing, I just figured it had grown bored and went away. Just then, I started hearing something. I could hear a third set of feet running behind us. My stomach dropped as I realised whatever that was, was running towards us. Our adrenaline kicked in and we started booking it to the exit. As we were getting closer to the exit, I could hear it again, whistling, but this time, ten feet away from me. We made it past the exit and out on the streets, and we didn't quit running till another block down. We stopped to catch our breaths and whatever was chasing us had quit at the stadium exit. Only me and my roommate know about this story. We've never really talked about it. That whistling is still the most disturbing thing I've ever heard in my life. Today, I, 19 male, was feeding the cats when I realised I had already experienced the exact moment like it happened months ago in a dream. I've experienced sights like this countless times and I'm wondering what's up. It's always an experience that lasts for say about a minute and I immediately recognise. I'd understand it if my dreams were based on my current situation and in the short term future, but between the dreams and the situation really unfolding, usually is months. I remember vividly dreaming about someone I only knew from the face being on the soccer pitch with me shooting a ball at the opponent's goal but missing by maybe a metre. Our club plays within a pool of teams within the region, so usually 14 to 16 matches are against teams you play against every year. However, the opponents in this case were wearing uniforms I didn't recognise. I didn't think much of it when that same player and I were scheduled to be on the same team. We did pretty okay and were allowed to continue in the cup, when I realised our opponents had the same exact uniform on as the one in my dreams. Sometime in the second half, the situation unfolded completely like I witnessed before. I'm not sure about the paranormal, and I don't even know if this would be the right subreddit, but does anyone know something about this, or experience something similar? I know it's called deja vu, but I can't find a scientific explanation. It creeps me out sometimes, and it's come to the point where I believe I don't really have a free will, and everything is completely set in stone already. Today, I, 19 male, was feeding the cats when I realised I had already experienced the exact moment like it happened months ago in a dream. I've experienced sights like this countless times and I'm wondering what's up. It's always an experience that lasts for say about a minute, and I immediately recognise. I'd understand it if my dreams were based on my current situation, and in the short term future, but between the dreams and the situation really unfolding, usually is months. I remember vividly dreaming about someone I only knew from the face being on the soccer pitch, with me shooting a ball at the opponent's goal but missing by maybe a metre. Our club plays within a pool of teams within the region, so usually 14 to 16 matches are against teams you play against every year. However, the opponents in this case were wearing uniforms I didn't recognise. I didn't think much of it when that same player and I were scheduled to be on the same team. We did pretty okay and were allowed to continue in the cup, when I realised our opponents had the same exact uniform on as the one in my dreams. Sometime in the second half, the situation unfolded completely like I witnessed before. I'm not sure about the paranormal, and I don't even know if this would be the right subreddit, but does anyone know something about this, or experience something similar? I know it's called deja vu, but I can't find a scientific explanation. It creeps me out sometimes, and it's come to the point where I believe I don't really have a free will, and everything is completely set in stone already.